Blog Talk Radio. Yo, 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 what's up, what's up, world? It's badass thugging like I usually do. And you better turn it up, bust some speakers out, because we off the motherfucking cup. You dig how we do it? Dog Pound Gangsters 2000 and beyond. Yo, yo, check this out. This is your girl, Cola Boke, and I'm chilling with my boys right here on Off the Cuff Radio. Because we're off the cuff right now. You big? Yeah. Uh, oh, what's up? What's up? It's your boy, Lil Yap, with UNLV, bragging them from the river, cooling with my homies and my family at Off the Cuff Radio. Y'all be sure to tune in on Fridays and get the latest scoop and find out what's happening. You with me? Tiffany Levine. And this Queen Cruz is your girl favorite bartender. And we're from Sex on the Rocks Podcast. All right, and you're now tuning in to Off the Cuff Radio. Yeah, because they keep representing that world hip hop. Well, really much love. All right. This is Miss Irresistible giving a shout out to the live show on Friday nights off the cuff radio. And I'm live from the 704. Make sure y'all tune in for the blazing hot music. Hey y'all, this is Stacey Lachey giving a shout out to King Eric and off the cuff radio. We're shaking, y'all. This is the grand. One half of Lost Cause and one third of that drive time thing. Sending my love to the homies over at Off The Cuff Radio. Tune in every Friday night for some real deal hip-hop conversation. These dudes are the connoisseurs of this thing. You already know what it is. BX Stand Up, Hud City, we're shaking. Peace. Yo, this is Joe Fresh to Dine, and y'all tuned in to the most raw, uncut show on radio. The Killer Team Team, Off The Cuff, and yo, Eric Sandman, Off The Cuff Clown, man. Yeah, 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 yeah. We doing this different this time around. We are now episode 326 at Off the Cuff Radio. I'm your host, King Eric the Great, alongside my other co-host, T Max with the facts. What it do, OTC Friday Night Flights? We here, man. And look, look, King, we got a special, special, special show tonight. Yes, indeed, man. And, you know, this show here is sponsored by Cocaine's Buddy Boy Entertainment, sponsored by Core Financial, sponsored by Jesse Boutiques and Dirty Basement Radio. It's a special show, man. You're right about that because we had to go straight to the straight to the show here. No music, no none of that. Because this man right here played a vital role in not only the success of Death Row Records and Rufus Records, but also the West Coast hip-hop scene. Possibly one of the realest guys in this business, a true a true good friend and pioneer of this culture. Let's all welcome Doug Young, y'all. What up, what up, what up, everybody? Man, you hear me? Doug. That's right, man. <laughs> yeah, we yes, sir. Here. What do you mean possibly the baddest motherfucker in this business, nigga? The baddest motherfucker in this business. <laughs> hey, hold on, let me get a huge possibly. Possibly what? We are even promote <laughs> out here. Possibly what? Nigga, possibly <laughs> what? Who? Name it out. Oh, I'll wait. Um Bill Booty would say, I'll wait. Uh no, on some real shit. Let me give my boy a uh, cocaine a big shot. I didn't know he was a um sponsor. And yes. Promoted yes, cocaine sir. too. When his name was cocaine and not who am I? You know, I got I got a story. Like I said, I got a story for everybody. And I remember when um, I go to Ruthless and get his record. Everybody waiting on cocaine record, right? It was a big war out for that shit. And uh, right, Dave Funkin Klein over at Hollywood Basics wanted him bad as a motherfucker, right? Mm-hmm. I'm curious, right? Yeah, yeah, um, of course. Anyway, oh yeah. Um, Oh, all right. Okay. Um, so, you know, the name, he was going to be able to keep the name with uh, Hollywood Basics. Hollywood Basics was Disney. It was letting Dave do whatever the fuck he want to do. So then um, 
I go to Ruthless one day, and they tell me that they did a deal with, I think it was CBS or somebody like that. I say, why y'all do that? You ain't going to get no better from than they. What the fuck are you doing? I mean, he had the lifeless projects. He had all kind of just dope-ass projects over there. Um, and plus, he was the one, Dave, rest in peace, Dave, he was the guy that showed me the overseas game. He was the first guy I ever went overseas with. And he showed me that motherfucking game, and I took it and ran with it. Um, but now, I don't uh, believe now, that. Mm-hmm. Now, Doug, hold for a second. Now, when you talk about the lifeless project, that was back in the day um, when they said, because I'm a – Cause I'm a gangster, I'm not a motherfucker. That was a dude who was in prison actually rapping, wasn't it? Yes, exactly. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. man. Dope ass track. I was like, and um, and, and Dave Funkenstein also was um, Rick Rubin's um, assistant. He came. He was living in Colorado um, when Def Jam first started. You know, he heard all the stuff and he he, he knew that that was him. So he dropped out of school. Wrote Rick Rubin a letter. That's when him and um, Russell Simmons were still staying in the dorms. Uh, right. And he just asked him, can I come out and be your intern? And it was his intern. And the first record he worked was the uh, LL Cool J, Rock the Bells. Mm. The purple labels. So he was like a mentor of mine. I would say like him, the 45 King, um, on that East Coast. Because they just they just took me under their wings. But, um, yeah, cocaine, man, um, it was a trip because it was really actually before Snoop and before they botched the name and all that who am I nonsense bullshit. I mean, when I first went, like, get back to Rufus, I went to go pick his stuff up. I was so excited. Oh, shit, everybody waiting on the cocaine and all the record stores keep asking me when I'm getting it, when I'm getting it. I'm like, hold on, I'm about to go get I get to the motherfucking Rufus record, nigga, and I see that who am I. I'm like, who the fuck is who am I? Who, what, what do you mean? Who was he? He cocaine, motherfucker. <laughs> Fuck you mean? Who the fuck is he? Who am I? What? I said, what is this? Oh, Blue Wop, uh, Time Warner was, you know, was a little, you know, sketchy on the name. They was feeling some type of way. So in order for the deal to go all the way through, we couldn't use the name cocaine. I'm like, are you motherfuckers serious? Man, I was, I mean, it was like they let all the air out of the fucking balloon, man. I, I saw that. I just shook my head. I'm like, oh, my God. This is going to be an absolute disaster. Tried my best yeah. with it, but, you know, I mean, come on. People going into a store, you know, especially like major stores. Where's the new co well, We don't have no artist named Cocaine here. But all the while, it's sitting in there. Name is Who Am I? And you got to understand how that shit works. So if you now got that stuff fresh at retail, right, and it's taken mm-hmm. all day to take off, you know, between like how returns used to work back then, if the record had a big buzz on it and if it's not really selling that first week, you know, most retailers will take the claims back because you'll get 85% of the money you spent on it. So imagine mm. the cocaine stuff is just sitting in there for that first week because people confuse that his name is not there. So they go into stores and they basically telling them he, we ain't got no cocaine album in here. So it's just a horrible misstep. But anyway, I just had to shout cocaine when I heard him come in on, no, on no. you know, sponsors. No, no, duh, no, duh, duh. When King didn't do the music, when King told me you were coming back on the show, I got a big ass Joker grin on my face because I was like, "This shit, we about to have round two of some of the most comedy ass moments in the history of the damn show." Because I'm like, Doug is gonna bring some shit that's gonna make us fall out laughing again. So, <laughs> yeah, well, you and all the truth. Tommy would possibly be one of the possibly my motherfucking ass. <laughs> <laughs> All these motherfuckers on the West Coast, you you notice like on social media, for instance, Instagram, you know, right? Because I don't fuck with Facebook right. no more. Ever since they put me in jail, they fucked up. I've never been back. Um, mm-hmm. You'll never hear nobody say, nigga, you didn't promote that. <laughs> Have you ever saw that in a comment? Right. Because every last nigga on this West Coast know what I did. Now, to some now degree, I was helping you. Go ahead. Yeah. And you know it's wild, though, because what you're saying about cocaine in terms of the name, because that's a perfect segue in terms of where you know how we do, man. Every time we get to talk, and we just start running off on everything. But, you know, it's funny because, right. of course, during the early 90s, 
that's when you're dealing with that situation of gangster rap still being so prevalent. And it's like, you know, now you got the, of course, you had all the controversy going on back in the day. I mean, this is a continuation from 10 years ago. Well, early 80s, of course, with Tipper Gore and the Prince album. And then when the labels got thrown thrown on the stickers. So, you know, uh, I, I mean, so, I mean, just, I mean, in general, during that time, what was it like to market albums during that time in the 90s? First of all, I used to lie my ass off. So all that shit that they were talking about, you know, you had clubs saying that you can come in there with no rap music. I'm telling them, I ain't got no rap music. I can't, I can't stand that shit. Ugh. hate rap music. Man, I have nothing but motherfucking fire heaters in my hand. But the reason why I was able to, I, I guess, mask it, when I first got into the business, uh, the first artist I ever promoted was Georgia, a guy I grew up with, you know, kind of was a little, little bit like, you know, people say Prince and that whole Minneapolis look of his. And we grew up together in San Francisco. And um, mm-hmm. actually, he's the reason why I moved to Los Angeles from the Bay Area, because after college, I was thinking about going back to San Fran. And I was like, nah, I don't want to go back to the city. That's like, he's a loser, you know. So, and yeah. I had to kind of get out of San Jose State because I had burnt stuff. Every bridge I had, and there was the police and the sheriff and everybody. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh Lord. So, <laughs> you know, fraternity life, you know, I love it, but, you know, I was outgrowing that. Georgia kept calling me, come on, Doug, man, you need to come to L.A. Boom, wop. I'm down here doing it. And I'm thinking this little nigga lying, right? I'm down here, I'm hanging out with James, man. Oh, wow, I'm doing this, I'm doing that. And, um, Lo and behold, shit, I get out here, and I meet uh, the, the bards a week after I got out here because I was staying out in Laverne at first, and yeah. then my, um, which was my fiance at the time, Ellie, Eleanor, which would be my wife, of course. Uh, she right. saw I was you know, just, just antsy. She's like, look, Sergio's been calling you. You need to just go up there and hang out with him because I can see you just getting restless out there. And she was right. I was on two wheels hitting that 210 going up to um, Betty Metal Studio in the Valley, and I get there, and Bobby D. Barge and Tommy D. Barge is in there, really about to help him with his stuff. The next door was Rick James. First day in LA. <laughs> <laughs> I was oh, like, man. what the fuck? This nigga wasn't lying. You know? So right. later on, you know, a couple more than the barges fell through. Uh, uh, James, James, James and Barge. James. Yeah, I think James was it Chico or the Rain. It was one of them. I, I know it was James because the reason why I know James is because I had to take James out to L's house because come to find out Janet had dropped him off there. And he didn't right. have no ride, right? So is that when him and Janet L were dating? Somehow, huh? Is that when him and Janet were dating or when they were married? They were dating at this time. Okay, got They were you. dating at this time. So so I, I take him out to L's house, and he said, come in, meet my brother, meet my brother. And um, L was in the garage working on uh, what would be their next album, which is the uh, Rhythm of the Night album and all that. To the beat of the rhythm of the night. He's working yeah. on that because he had a fly studio in his garage. And then all of a sudden, I hear James on his, his, his landline phone. You know, that's when we basically had house phones. People had sales, right. but not as I mean, you know, you know what I'm talking about. This is now 80. This is now either late, yeah, 83. This is late 83. We in the, um, when it's just like $5 a minute for the sale. You, you talking yeah. about $5 a minute. You mean $20-something a minute with them big old briefcases <laughs> on? <laughs> yeah, the charge ports and all that shit. Yeah. Yep. So, anyway, come to find out it was Janet on the phone cursing his ass out. So him better get his ass home. Oh, oh. So, so then uh, he asked me, hey, I got to go home. I said, oh, you don't live here? He said, I said, but, man, I got to go. He said, and then uh, and he said, well, just take me, uh, drop me off. You know, because at this point, it's late at night. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going to be in trouble. Uh, I'm going take them staying with their parents or mom or dad. You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, okay, right, dude, right. we got to do this. We got to go. We got to go. So get on the, uh, we, you know, get on the freeway on the 101 on Roscoe. We get off on, um. Havenhurst. Get off on Havenhurst. We now we crossing over because you're gonna come up. It was the Gilsons to the left, so we cross the street over, 
goes to the supermarket. And as I'm coming up the street, I see like about 200, 300 people just in the street. I say, what's going on here? Um, ah, he looked at me. Uh, come to find out he was, you know, feeling nice, and I'm just going to leave it there, right? He started, like, right, looking right. at me with a big old Chester Cat smile on his face, right? I'm like, okay. <laughs> I said, what do you mean that people always be here? Oh, they just be out in front of their house. They be wanting to see Michael. Like, Michael? <laughs> Still not getting it yet, right? Right. So he tells me, turn into the gate. So go to the gate, and there's some guards there. And he look, they look, and then they look and see James, and they just opens up the gate and wave us through. So mm-hmm. roll through the house, and I see Michael out by where – it, was, it looked like a garage, but it's really a movie theater when you come into the house back then, right? And off to the left, oh, man. It's be the, actually, yeah, it's going to be actually a house. It was a fly-ass movie theater they had, right? And it's all kind of like peacocks and little animals and shit running around the, 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 the grounds. And, uh, and Janet comes down there, and she goes in on James. I'm not going to go too far in the business. Uh, and then she said, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Then she said, thank you for bringing him home. Then she said, what's your name? I've never seen you before. I said, my name is Doug. I, I said, I just came and dropped him off. I was dropping him off at brother's house, and he said he had to come home. And she looked at me, and she said, you're different. I mean, you're from L.A.? I said, no, I'm from San Francisco. I've only been out here like a week. She said, really? I said, yeah. And uh, she said, well, thanks. You need any gas money? I said, oh, no. And she said, wow. Um, and then she, she she said to me, hold, hold on, let me, let me, James, James, go upstairs and blah, 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 right? So she tells me, look, you can come back anytime you want to pick him up. He said, she said, they're different. So I was like, okay, I guess. And I just left. And then, you know, from there, just started meeting everybody. Man, so you ended up in that, and for, and for our listeners that don't know, Mr. Young is talking about where he made that turn off. He pulled up into Neverland Ranch in front of in Michael Jackson's house. His no, this is right? Neverland. This is this is this is their Encino house. There. Neverland is oh, out the, there okay, in so Santa this, is the family, this is the family house. This, this is the family, family house, house. right? Where, where they got stayed in Havenhurst. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. in Encino. Okay, got right. you. So this, so this is the Jackson estate. Got you. Got yeah, you. this is okay. years before Neverland about to happen. Remember, this yes, is '83. Yes, this is right. at the height of Thriller. When Thriller right. is just exploding, you know. Yeah, yeah. That man. So I mean, so once you, so obviously, you know, I mean, because I mean, we're getting right into the history of you know your diverse you know, experiences, you know. Uh, so, I mean, so after you pretty much make that acquaintance with the Jackson family, you know, Tito, Marlon, Reby, you know, all Well, no, Michael. maybe just, no, no, that's not true, because I always like to tell stories and what actually happened. Their okay, mom, yeah. their, their, their mom, I, I don't put extras on shit. Janet. Okay, got you. It was mainly Janet and their mom, and I would see Michael float in and out. He just kind of stayed out the way. And then, like, even when I was starting to go over there and get him, I may have seen Michael one time when we were all eating breakfast, you know, at um, uh, breakfast in the morning, I was coming to get him, and Michael was there eating, too, you know, and I was was just real quiet when I was there, you know, when I was upstairs, I'd be just in the kitchen sitting, not saying nothing to nobody, and just getting to eat. Right. But mainly then I just really started hanging out with the bars, and myself and Giorgio, and then Giorgio knew everybody. I mean, he, he was not lying. He he knew fucking absolutely everybody. And wow. So then, um, like even from there, you know, he knew all the clubs. We would go to this club, Carlos and Charlie's back then. This is before hip hop. If you want me to get that part of my early part out of the way, so then we meet Prince right. now one day, one day there, and uh. I'm already in the VIP now. I'm like, I'm, I'm getting LA. I'm, I'm getting good at this shit. I'm talking cats off of tuna trunks, right? Talking my way into the VIP with uh, Brian. He was like the main security dude there, and everybody was like him. Jim Brown, all the Lakers used to come, the Showtime Lakers, uh, Eddie oh, wow. Murphy. I mean, everybody is in this piece, man. 
you know, um, just, just everybody name. And then one day we're in there and, um, we already, I'm already back there hanging out with Jim Brown because me and Jim Brown is now cool too, right? Jim Brown mm-hmm. buying drinks. So I'm, I'm kind of buzzing. I see motherfucking Prince and, uh, uh, and, um, uh, hit, you know, Prince crew comes in, right? Did you see and the aura, the aura, the aura? Did you see it? I mean, that motherfucking club parted <laughs> like the fucking blue sea. And that little <laughs> tiny motherfucker was mopping, right? And now I'm drunk, but at the same time, I'm laughing. <laughs> so I used to get really silly when I laughed with the Long Island Night Tees. That was the drink back in the day, right? So right. I'm laughing. I'm like, that old motherfucking prince. So we back there. Now I'm with Giorgio. Now this is what it, <laughs> this way shit about to get funny, right? So we back right. there. I'm chilling. Giorgio looking nervous. Prince cutting his eyes at Giorgio. Giorgio cutting his eyes at Prince. Now these motherfuckers having an eye cutting sword fight. <laughs> 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 You know, like the, that third man. He had the crossover. And that's effect. wild, Doug. Yeah. And that's like King said, because, you know, for a lot of our, for our listeners out there, um, what Dave Chappelle and Charlie Murphy were talking about on uh, Chappelle's show, that's true. Prince really did play basketball. He was I'm telling you, bro. He, he really did. He, 
He really did. He really did Check play basketball out, bro. when he was in high school. Yeah. And check this out. The, the third game, I said, Giorgio, I'm guarding that motherfucker this time. That nigga lit my ass off. Damn near broke my ankles. Nigga, I sprung my ankle. <laughs> oh, Lord. Because <laughs> I, I went up, because I, I was like, fuck that. I'm going to this shit. You know what I'm saying? Shit, but I, mm-hmm. I jumped wrong. You see what I'm saying? And when I came down, mm-hmm. so basically we didn't finish the last game. They would have beat us anyway. But uh, I didn't start hobbling around, and Prince is cracking up, man. So then after we uh, do that, then he's like, hey, Y'all should, y'all should come up to the house. And then uh, we was like, where is that? And he was he was living, uh, he said, you know, um, he was uh, renting Madonna's house up in the hill. Oh, wow. Okay. So we go so we go to the to, to his house. And then uh, he's like, if y'all know any girls, man, y'all can call them over. So we started calling some girls over there and, and all kind of shit. <laughs> and so anyway, long story short, they ended up uh, Brown Mark ended up getting Georgia a deal with I'm gonna speak the story of Brown Marks ended up getting Georgia a deal with Paisley Park. Then Georgia go to Minneapolis, start messing with Prince's girls, they bump heads. So uh, Prince told Mark he had to drop him because he wasn't putting him out on his label. Georgia comes back to L.A. dejected, feeling bad. But guess where he was living? In Hollywood at the Afton Arms, right? So mm-hmm. we then, as I used to go to their house, there was this record company I saw on Afton and Santa Monica named Cola Records. So while the time mm-hmm. that George was in Minneapolis, I'm, I'm, I'm over at his house a lot, hanging out with his cousin Jeff, okay, Jeff House, you know, and um, – and then, which will be his wife, that was Kelly's apartment where all these young actors were staying. All the top actors, you know, used to stay in this one apartment. And Kelly, her friends, early friends, was like Vivica Fox. She was large before them. Um, what's her name? Um, Halle Berry, all them girls, all these same girls used to be out in front of Elle's house all the time. I'm telling you. Oh, only one oh, that would, Only one that would be able to come in the house was Janet. And she would usually come in there to get in James AFF, right? So anyway, long story yeah. Anyway, long story short, they they did a pretty good demo with Georgie in Minnie, Giorgio in Minneapolis, right? And it was this one record they had called Dangerous. That motherfucker was a hit. I kept telling George for Georgia, that was a hit, man. That's fucked up, you ain't gonna be able to put that out. And then all of a sudden I had an idea. I said, Giorgio, I was you nigga. I'd take that motherfucking record and flip it just a little bit, right? I mean they dropped mm-hmm. you and you you helped write it, right? And just call it something else. And let's go down the street because we could walk to McCola. You see what I'm saying? McCola was like, right. like four or five blocks from this house. And I, and I said, when you was gone, because um, I could tell someone going cool, you know what I'm saying? I asked him how much would it cost to press a dollar. And he said, $1,000. I said, motherfucker, if we just press that shit, nigga, and let's just go promote it ourselves. See what happened. He said, that's a good idea. <clears throat> so as soon as the record was pressed, Nigga, we go to we fly to New York, right? We go to BLS and um and it was it was BLS and Kiss at that time, right? Those were the two main stations. I got go. I don't know how I talk. It was fucking freezing. We stand in um uh um what's that a uh, Tribeca area? Motherfucking rats looked at like cats. I swear to God, it was freezing out of that bit. It stunk real bad, and this is the winter time, right? I mean, snow oh. everywhere, but rats run at night run rampant, right? So mm-hmm. we go to BLS. I talk our way in there. Me, I talk our way in there. Talk it. I just say, George, when we got when we first get to the door, I just say, George, we had these fly ass trench coats. I had a bad ass wardrobe. George used to wear a lot of the trench coaches, coats because remember we stayed in San Francisco, so I had Perry Ellis, Calvin Klein, all kind of trench coat fly ass shit, right? Uh, very mm-hmm. expensive looking, and um, somehow uh, I said, "Just sit here, remember, just look mysterious." Now, okay, put that eyebrow up, put that eyebrow. Come on, George, put the damn eyebrow up, right? And then I said, hey, <laughs> yeah, "We have an appointment now, man. We got an appointment up there. They folks come see. We came way out here for San Francisco." And then they was like, "Okay, okay, come on in. Ain't gonna have y'all." And then they was like, "Show me some ID. You come from all the way from California, and we show them my ID, right?" Yeah, we had an appointment. They must just ain't got us in the book. I'm lying my ass off, right? 
You get all the way up to the, <laughs> on to the motherfucking air, and the motherfucker put the record on and played it right then and there on the station in New York. Oh, man. Go to the motherfucking other station and do the same motherfucking thing. Told us some shit. I said, yeah, we just left here. We, they be telling us not to come over here. You know, I'm now dividing and conquer. Uh, play the record. You know, we had a meeting with them because, you know, they wanted to be the first one to break. But we want y'all to break this shit on the same day. Shit, fuck what they're talking about. I'm in New York. I'm going to come hang out with anybody I want. Go up there, do the same thing, and play the motherfucker on the air. Nigga, we happy as a motherfucker. We coming out there. We smiling. We walking around New York. And guess who I run into? We mm. run into Ice-T. We run into Ice-T. Um, uh, what was his name? Um, it's his DJ, uh. Uh, he he, he e. was with a no not what evil e it was a New York dude okay. uh, DJ it was, it was, was DJ Aladdin huh no 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 Aladdin Aladdin ain't with him dude no 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 this is a New York dude hold on hold on his name was uh okay. Africa no Africa. yeah yeah no and no his name was Africa Islam I think yeah 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 Izzy yeah Izzy Africa Islam yeah. Africa is was a DJ yeah Izzy right and then he had this other dude what he named Eminem and then, you know, because Kelly knew him. You know, Kelly would, uh, right. cause remember, dudes doing movies. Him and Kelly had did a movie, too. Of course, I knew who Ice-T was, you know. He was, you know, had six in the morning cracking at, at that time, right? And um, right. they was like, look, we're going to be at this club on 6th Street in New York. The line, like, y'all should roll through tonight. We was like, yeah, because we ain't got shit to do. And then he was like, y'all got two, y'all got records, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, bring the records. And uh, uh, Izzy said, yeah, I'm going to play the shit. So we get there in the club cracking, nigga. I don't know whatever happened to that little rapper named Eminem. That nigga was hard as a motherfucker, right? He killed that shit, that little beatboxy shit, and his flow was nice. He was nice, and um. So anyway, so we there, you know, they told the Georgia record on, and motherfuckers already had knew the record because they kept playing it on those two stations in New York, right? So um, mm-hmm. so we 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 there, we get back to Cali, we all pumped up. And I was like, come on, Georgia, we got we, we to gotta keep this momentum going. So we, 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 I said, let's go home. Let's go, let's go back up to the Bay Area and get it on KDIA and KSOL and K-Pool and just get it on all the stations in the Bay Area. Then we're going to come back to L.A. and get this shit on the stations in L.A. Then we're going to go do Riverside. Then we're going to go do Coachella Valley. Y'all know what it is. That now it used to be just Palm Springs back in the day. Um, mm-hmm. And then we're going to get it on in San Diego. We're going to get it on in Santa Barbara. Nigga, we did all that. So the team that, that I devised was Lionel, which was my fraternity brother. I'm a Sigma. Lionel's a Sigma. You know, John Lewis was a Sigma. Mm-hmm. Rest in peace to John Lewis. Um, of course. You know, so he, 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 yeah, he was, he was helping. Lionel was helping me because Lionel lived in Orange County in Fullerton. So I used to go over to hang out with my frat brothers at Cal State Fullerton. And Jeff Howe, mm-hmm. and all of these names going to make sense as I keep telling these stories, Okay. Jeff House was yeah, the from New Orleans. Yeah. So the, the uh, so then we get all of that stuff on. Giorgio ended up getting a $7 million deal from Motown. We didn't really get the monies we got. I just had a new daughter, Erica, so I had to go find a job. So I'm like, hmm, one day I was just going to go to the bar's house, you know, real feeling real sad, like, damn, this nigga, you know, didn't take care of a dude. You know what I'm saying? But once you have a kid, it's just your whole mindset change. You don't want your kid looking at you with broke ass and, Ain't got no money coming back with excuses. Talking about you in the record business and ain't got a nick, two nickels to run together. So right. what I did one day, I was, I was planning on going just to hang out with the debards, right? So I'm on the 101 mm-hmm. and I'm look at the I look at the Gower eggs and I'm like, you know something? I'm about to get off this motherfucking freeway and go down to McCola and ask for a job, nigga. You need a job. I'm talking to myself. I use do shit like this, right? Nigga, you need a job, okay? Your wife doing right. everything. You know, we now done bought a fucking house. You see what I'm saying? All kind of shit, right? Mm-hmm. And um, so I just got off the, I just got off the freeway. So I'm just like, man, get off the freeway, bro, and go get a job. I get off the freeway and um, go down there, and everybody was just so surprised to see me. Like, Doug, we thought all you guys would be rich now. Hear about all the money that Jerry Heller and Maury Alexander and Russ Regan signed to deal for George at Motown, right? $7 million deal, right? And I uh, mm-hmm. told him, man, I didn't really get, make, make, make no money from that. I said, and that's the reason I'm down here, Don. I mean, I need a job, man. I just had a daughter, dude. I need a job. I need a job. I need, you know I can promote records. 
He said, wait a minute, George Hill didn't pay you guys? I said, no, nah, bro. The dude didn't really give us no money, not where I can make a grown man living with. You just can't make no grown man living with your money. You ain't got no fucking job, man. You got some kid shit. And um, so he was like, wow. He said, yeah, of course, you can have a job here. He said, well, uh, what do you want to do? I said, I, I can promote the rap stuff. I'm good. I like the rap or just records I know will hit. He said, okay. He said, no, no problem. He said, Doug, don't even worry about it. You're going to work here. He said, I see you're really upset. I said, yeah. He said, just do me a favor. Just go back. You know where all of the promotional stuff is. He said, you still know the, the run of the land over here. Just go pick out each in each record that you really will work, and uh, I'm going to pay you per record, all right? And then um, – <clears throat> I'm going to he said, I'm going to pay you four thousand dollars for three months, and you got to work the record three months, Doug. Okay, I said yeah, yeah. Each record, okay, but just go do your thing. You don't have to give me no reports because I know how good you are. So I go back there. I see six in the morning. Grab that shit. I grab all the Egyptian lover stuff and even the new stuff. And then it was new stuff about to come out like TNT underwater rhymes. I grab. Uh, H. and Gregory, Underwater Ryan, that hadn't came out yet. That's about to come out, right? I grabbed uh, right. MC Hammerhead, MC Hammerhead, Stupid Def Yell. That, they had made some copies in the Bay Area, but they needed a bigger pressing thing. Mark. And they were just right. you know, to, to where they can help them get their stuff out. So I grabbed MC Hammer, Stupid Def Yell. I grabbed the Surgery album. I just started grabbing. I grabbed all of the shit that was on unknown, unknown DJ label called Techno Hop at the time because – to me, he had King T and all of that. I grabbed all that, all of his stuff. His shit was dope. Um, then, of course, y'all know I grabbed all the Lonzo stuff. And, you know, it was a few, like, little clubby records that I could do some with. So I'm looking at these stacks of records that I've got my hand. It's like, I'm like, damn, this one fucking give me all this money for this shit right here. And lo and behold, I walk about that motherfucking place with damn near $30,000 $30, check that I cashed immediately. And I went to work. That next day, I went to work. I loaded up. He, he said, well, take as many as you can. I had a Suzuki Samurai back then, right? So right. I said, I'm going to get more, but I can get started because I live way out towards the Inland Empire, right into Kuka, Smunga, slash Fontana, but mainly Fontana, right there on Citrus. That's like the border. But I lived off Foothill mm-hmm. and Citrus back then, and these are brand-new homes in a brand-new area. And guess who lived around the corner from me? Cocaine. Who that? When he, oh. Cocaine did Okay, he lived. Yeah, he lived in Rancho Cucamonga. He lived on the Rancho Cucamonga side of it. I live right right at the borderline, Fontana, Fontana Rancho Cucamonga. But cocaine's going to live around the corner for me. I don't know this yet, though. You see what I'm saying? So right. I just told him I'm going to grab these ones and I'm going to go out to Palm Springs and just start promoting and come in and I'm going to be up here like around noon to grab more. And then I was doing all that shit and the record that, oh, yeah, I grabbed We Want Some Pussy, the Two Live Crew, um, I'm just trying to think of something that can't get. Man, that was a big record. Ooh, we want some pussy. You don't remember that? Yeah. That shit, yeah, that shit played in the clubs out here for about five, six years straight. Whatever. They, they, they was able to move to Miami, nigga, and create their own little thing out there because they from Riverside. At least the group is. And that group got put together by Rodney and Joe. Yeah, I did Rodney and Joe Cooley. Yeah, um, roll. Yeah, all that. I, I did everybody. I did everybody, man. And, um, I did everybody's shit, and then he started noticing when I was promoting shit, that shit started selling, selling. And he was like, damn. So then, you know, and that's how I met Easy, because um, Jerry saw that I was back down there, and that's when he, Jerry told me, like the first day he physically met Easy, I met Easy that same day, because Jerry wanted me to be at that meet. Jerry knew I was, mm-hmm. but Jerry one got the deal for Georgia. So and that's how right. it should happen. And it just started snowballing from there. Then I just got a name. Like, if you're trying to put a rap record out, every fucking, because remember now, this is the cocaine 80s, too. So every drug dealing, hustling nigga in L.A. was looking for me. You know, because I was making records happen, you know. And, uh, you know, artists, you know, he had his stuff. He did some of King T stuff. Artists had the first rap store. Him and Greg Mack started to Rage Records, Mid City Records, and then can't forget the god of L.A. hip-hop, Roger Clayton, Uncle Jam's Army, had his shit, and I'm lacing all them. So now I'm meeting everybody, and this is how I meet all the DJs. 
my fraternity brother, DJ Clientele, you know, um, mm-hmm. Mark, you know, he Hawkins, you know what I'm saying? And um, and then he, I was like, damn, man, I'm, I'm, I need a shortcut to these DJs in L.A. He said, well, they got this DJ crew called the Mix Master, right? And then I did used to hear them on K-Day. Like, Would that be Mix you Master stayed and all those guys? Huh? Would that be Mix Master stayed and all those guys? Yes, Mix Master Spade. This is what Tony G, Julio G, Joe Cooley, yeah. all the Bob Bobcat. Right, yeah. This is what, yeah, all of them about to come. Aladdin, DJ Jamming James, M. Walt, Romeo, Trace E, oh, wow. Ralph M. All these are the DJ Battle Cat. Okay. Yeah. And Battle Cat, Battle Battle Cat is the first person I ever took on the road with me when I was trying to be a whack rapper. I tried to rap. I pressed my own record. I was Dougie Doug and Master Ryan, and that's who the group that NWA gets. It was Romeo and Master Ryan. But that was at first my group, but I was a whack-ass rapper. So I said, nah, let me just promote records. But um, that's how that beef with them two started, because I hooked that beef up, you know, to get us some light. And, first, and then Master Ryan going to try to step the ring at Manual Arts one time, get into a fight with him. And nigga, they basically the niggas gonna try to jump Ren, and I wasn't gonna let that happen. Ren is there by itself, and then Master Ryan and his crew and these niggas, I managed, right? Romeo and all right. them niggas was there, and they from Compton and shit. I'm like, nigga, you niggas ain't about to do shit to Ren, nigga, and that's some old dirty ass shit, nigga. Even trying to play with that dude like that, man. Dude's helping us out, man. Fuck's wrong with you niggas? You niggas letting this shit go to y'all head? And nigga, right. Ren was hot the damn fish grease, right? <laughs> And then them niggas pull some little scandal shit on me. After I go off on them, they get mad at me, and they started rolling with my man Mike Ross at Delicious Vinyl. So basically, they went over there and got a deal with Mike behind my back. So when them niggas got that deal with Mike behind my back, they got told motherfucking easy to destroy them niggas. <laughs> Ready to destroy them niggas. You understand what I'm saying? We, we still boys to sit to this day. We laugh about a lot of that shit, but... That sounded like a lot of all of that type of stuff started, you know, and I was managing a lot of people. I had M Walk in the Union, and, you know, and a whole bunch of artists I was managing. I started managing Dub C and, 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 and Coolio, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, and, and DJ that was, low profile. that was low profile. That was low profile. Yeah, that's low. Yeah. Exactly. That's low profile. So as I'm doing that, nigga, I'm still over here helping with this motherfucking, doing that, man. Wop, wop, wop. And that's, I started spreading myself through thin. And then after them niggas did that betrayal, and then, you know, after a while, I was doing I was doing too much, so I got to blame myself on some of that shit. Nigga, you're doing way too much. Nigga, you better concentrate on something. But then I just told all the acts, man, y'all just go ahead and go y'all separate ways. We good. I'll promote y'all stuff, but I, I can't manage no more. I'm just going to promote records, man. I'm not fucking with the management. I ain't getting none of you niggas no more record deals, none of that shit. Because I started right. the rap department at Capitol Record. I started the rap department at MCA Records. I'm starting rap departments everywhere. I'm putting niggas on, nigga. I'm, I'm getting niggas jobs. G of G O Biven. You know, when Jeff Sledge first stepped to me at the Music Seminar, I asked how to get him. Ben, I say, easy, go ask somebody to intern for him. And whatever that motherfucker tell you, do the records, do it. He said, okay. I said, I would hire you, but I'm in L.A. And he said, okay, yeah. I said, I'm serious. Go do it. I don't give a fuck. Go one of them small interns. Tell him I said it. I tell him I said he needs you to hire him. You see what I'm saying? So my name started ringing, you know what I'm saying? Like getting, and people was asking me, so I'm making a lot of money consulting, doing all kinds of shit, helping people put together their rap department. Now, Lionel, Jeff, and myself did that Georgia thing. I got to back this up. because This is where we about Good. to now come into Bad Boy after I leave Ruthless, right? After right. I leave Ruthless, Bad Boy tries to recruit all of us. Well, basically, Arista did telling us to, mm-hmm. they want me, Lionel, and Jeff to move to New York and just and that was take control of the rap pop department. And I'm like, nigga, I'm not moving to no damn New York. I'm going to visit New York, love New York. I'm from California. Stay the fuck right here. It's like, well, man, we're going to leave. We're going to go to New York, dude. And go ahead. So uh, they say, you sure you don't want to come in? He's offering us all this money. I said, man, I'm not moving to no New York. You two go to New York. You know, I'm going to still promote records here. Go promote that stuff for him. So, um, and that was a trip because Puffy was originally, you know, was on MCA. We already talked about that, so I ain't even got to go to that this time. But Puffy was right. originally on MCA Records. And um, and that's just how I, I became the promoter. I was, I was just going to concentrate on that. I will promote. 
Man, so I mean, I mean, so we're, I mean, obviously, you know, what I mean, just Doug, I mean, you're just taking us through this whirlwind of what it was like promoting during that time in the West Coast. I mean, because you're bringing so many historical figures, you know, so many names into this. I mean, for where everything was moving at the time, did any of you know? what this was eventually going to bring, that you all were going to play such an integral role in not only West Coast hip-hop, but hip-hop history. I mean, when did you realize no, that? Because, because, like, be, because, yeah. No, let me, let, me, let me step in there. No, because it was just happening organically. And hip-hop right. was real. Right? Those motherfuckers wanted to recognize it or not. You know, I, right. helped, I helped East 40 with his early stuff. Um, only person I didn't help mm-hmm. really on the, on the West Coast is Too Short and, and Ice mm-hmm. T. Those are the two. Mm-hmm. And King T, those three right there was, to me, of course, even though I did all of their early first, I did their first record, you see what I'm saying, mm-hmm. before they dropped anything else, but I don't count them. And the reason why I definitely don't count Too Short, because Too Short first shit was a tape that he used to sell at Lake Merritt. On Sunday. It was all 75 year old Yeah, exactly. Out of that Elder Rod Cadillac. He really had that shit. And I found out yeah. about him through my sister Letty. You know what I'm saying? She was like, you need to come up to, to Lake Mary on Sunday. It's this nigga named Too Short, man. You should see if you can get him a deal. So I grabbed the tape. I mean, he was cool, don't get me wrong. But it was just like, hmm, the, the, the fucking actual musical part of the shit was dope as fuck. And it was real hood, but it was like, well, he's too far. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it seemed like he had his own thing. And then it was so funny, while I was up there, I get a call from, um, um, what's his name? Um, St. Saint, Saint, uh, Charles. Yeah, St. Charles, Charles, yeah. Charles. E-40, yeah, uncle. Yeah. E-40. I get a call from him. And he said, like, look, man, I got your number from this, that, and the other. I hear you in the Bay Area. I'm like, you know I'm in the Bay Area? He said, yeah, I hear you up here um, right now. He said, since you're here, can you come out to Vallejo? I'll pay for your gas, and, you know, I'll pay for your time. I won't just have you come out here, but I have a project, my my uh, nephew, that I'm, I want to help with him. Then he was just so polite. He was just telling about him. I was like, you know what I'm saying? Go ahead and see what this man talking about, because the way he came at me, right? So I mm-hmm. get out there. Get to his house, and this motherfucker had a nice house, and the fucking garage looked like a distribution center, but very fucking organized. I was blown the fuck away, right? And I'm like, wow. And then he, you know, he was showing me shit that I didn't know, because he, going to find out, I guess he was an artist in the 60s or something, right? So... He knew all the one stops. He had big lists of. I mean, this dude, this dude, this shit, his shit was flawless. You understand what I'm saying? And then he was like, "You want to hit a record?" I said, no, nah, I don't even need to hit a record. I'm gonna work the record. <laughs> this shit is some of the most amazing shit I've ever seen in my life. He said, "Really? You gonna work the record?" I said, "Hell yeah, I'm gonna work the record." I gave my address. I said, "Just send my product here." As a matter of fact, I'm not gonna even charge y'all that much. I usually charge this. You guys can just pay this. Uh, um, you know what I'm saying? And then that motherfucking, um, that record took off. That fucking record took off. And, and you know, that's just like the way that certain things is just, it was just hunches. You see what I'm saying? And, and I always, anytime I would hear about a dope rapper, I would personally go and visit. Now that I think about some of the stuff that I did, I was real personable with them. When hung out with them, when met their family, because most of them were staying with their moms and dads still. You know what I'm saying? And what no, mm-hmm. you know, and just, and just would go hang out with them. And that's what I did, man. I just, I would just go hang out, like, with the union. You know, we, we had our little uh, uh, hideout right there on Western and Kings, right in the back of this gas station. It's a sales station over there, right? In South, you know, in L.A. And that's who I used to hang out with the union. You know, I'd go out to Compton, hang out with Aladdin and or Master Rhyme. Ma- Master Rhyme stayed right there by Kelly Park, where Easy e from. That's why that nigga Kelly Park Compton Crip, yeah. Yeah, yeah, kid, Compton Crip. Yeah, he was, he, 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 yeah, Master Ryan was a Crip, too. And then, you know, okay. you got the wet, and then, then uh, uh, M. Walk was over in the na- blood neighborhood, but he was in the blood, you know what I'm saying? He's West Side Pyrus. He's in West Side mm-hmm. Pyrus neighborhood. 
You know what I'm saying? So, and then that's when I was able to just float. I could even, you know, like, do with the Mexicans like that, like in, you know, like in um, East L.A., you know, the shops out there, they all knew me, you know, and as you know, I did early promotion for Cypress Hill, Funk Dubious, like I told you, managed Ralph M., you know, really helped Cypress Hill. I saw them make that first album because first Latin, I mean, Muggs and, first Muggs and Matthew used to be roommates. Then Muggs and um, Aladdin was roommates. So while we was making a low-profile album, they was making their first album, Killer Man album. Mm-hmm. So I heard all of them demos over and over. We'd be up there sleeping on the floor at the apartment in Hollywood. And and then I'm I'm listening to, yeah, okay, we got this many songs. Because we went through 20 songs before I said, okay, we ready to roll. You see what I'm saying? And um, it's just, you know, you you back then I didn't even really feel it. I would jump in the car, really, and I would drive sometimes just as tiptoe up on the Oregon border. You know what I'm saying? And just mm-hmm. cut back. Right. And then when I get tired, you hey, know, I hang out. Hmm? Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, you know, we talk about Cypress Hill, because I remember I did a video about them, like, last year, I believe, how unappreciated they are, because they brought a lot to the table. Yeah, but let me tell you something. That album almost died a horrible death. Let me tell you what happened. Mm-hmm. That was the first record, and I was pissed off, too, that I didn't get just out the box. They gave it to Paul Stewart. My man Paul, me and him, his friends, PMP Promotion, right? And, mm-hmm. um... I'm like, what? And Karen Mason, she was the chronic manager over at Karen Mason at over at Columbia, right? Nigga, I was hot as a goddamn firecracker, right? And uh, I'm like, nigga, them my motherfucking homeboys. I know where that record gonna have to go first. That motherfucker, you niggas ain't gonna do that record, right? Y'all know what the fuck y'all doing. I'm talking shit, right? Nigga, every day, nigga, I call her talking shit. She would hang up on my motherfucking crazy skinny ass, right? So, nigga, I'm talking shit, and I'm like. And then, because at that time, people could stand Be Real's voice. They used to talk so much shit about that voice, they didn't get it. I knew how dope that album was, because I heard it a trillion fucking times. Muggs had put together a masterpiece. The key was going to be getting people to accept this voice. But I had mm-hmm. already had a game plan for it. So they give the motherfucking record to Paul Stewart. Paul had it cracking in the Melrose area at that time, in like the Santa Monica area, in that little West L.A. But I went every fucking where. You see what I'm saying? I went everywhere. I wasn't just there in Los Angeles promoting. You know, I'd go and hang out with Paul, and Paul was my friend. You know, that's when he was staying with, um, what's his name, uh, Skate Master Tate, rest in peace. Amanda was his roommate, which she was then married to one of the brothers. I mean, they, she was dating one of the, the brothers that was a, in charge of Joe and TV Raps. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Uh, so we was all over there. That was our little cookie corner of like our little weird hip hop where blacks and whites and, you know, the skateboard looking motherfuckers in hip hop was hanging out. We would hang there and like Michael Ross is across the street in delicious vinyl from Paul's Nim house, right? Upstairs is guess who? The Stephen Rifkin Company. He's not Loud Records yet. You see what I'm saying? Uh, he's going to then become Loud Records, and it was just upstairs is Faye Dumanay and Steve Rifkin. Downstairs is Mike, Matt Dykes, and his brother. You know what I'm saying? Delicious mm-hmm. vinyl. Across the street is Amanda, Skate Master Tate, and, and, and Paul Stewart. You see what I'm saying? So that was our little hub in Hollywood where we just go hang out on Melrose, smoke weed, you know, and just chill. And I used to go over there a lot because, like, I still stayed out in the Inland Empire, and I let the traffic die, and I just go crash somewhere in the house, just walk in the house, you know what I'm saying? It, you know, it would be a house full of people, you know what I'm saying? I would just go to in Paul's room or somewhere and find me a place to make. I'd even be sleeping in closets. I would be so tired from all that running I would be doing, right? Paul said, man, no, nah, you can't leave, though. You got to get some sleep. I said, Paul, you know I'm not mad because you got the thing. I'm just like, they should have gave it to both of us. Fucking CBS records. You got enough fucking money to get greedy pieces of shit. So basically, record comes out. Okay, the first Cypress Hill album comes out. And this motherfucking album almost dies a horrible death. Right? 
And I'm talking shit the whole while, calling Karen Mason's ass back in New York, right? At the New York office, right? Yeah, motherfucker, I told you, yeah, and now I'm too fake, motherfucker. You know what the fuck y'all was doing? Just thought you was going to put that shit out. You know what the hell you was motherfucking doing? So um, one day, you know, I, I leave her alone for like a couple of weeks, right? But I already know it's dying a horrible death because I'm going into the record store and ain't none of the shit moving, right? Right. One day she called me. She said, Doug, I'm about to lose my job. I'm in trouble. You was right. I said, what happened? She said, 12, 12 16-wheel trucks of their product went back to the warehouse. I said, what? I said, return? She said, yes. 16 wheel trucks of their product went back to CBS. She said, Yes. I said, Oh my God. And she said, And they're about to destroy it. I said, You tell them motherfuckers they better not destroy shit. Get at least three, three of the 16 wheel trucks out to my house in two fucking days or your ass is in trouble. I told her, Drill some of the product. Only one, 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 one quarter of it. Don't drill it because I'm going to have to. Uh, bribe people, you see what I'm saying? But drill all the products. Send the shit to my house. Don't pay me yet. You're going to owe me for this one. But I'm going to save this fucking project. I can let my boys go out like that, right? I tell her that. She said, you sure you think you can save it? I said, I know I can goddamn save it. You just get that shit here in two fucking days. I stay on a brand new Court Street, brand new neighborhood at this time, right? So I'm on a, I'm on a Court Street show. Shit. It wasn't two days. It got there in three days. It was a Friday morning. Never forget it. I hear it outside, doo, 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 like there's about to be some big construction shit going on, right? Nigga, I go mm-hmm. outside in my motherfucking robe, and like you would see a nigga in his robe going out to grab his paper and check his mailbox, and I've got my right. flippers on, my Suzuki's in the driveway, and I look to see what the fuck's going on here, what's all that noise? It is three 16-wheel trucks of their product. Mm. I went. Oh, oh man. my God. I went, oh, my God. And that motherfucking, so only two trucks could fit in there at the one time, so the other truck was just sitting up there waiting until we unloaded this shit. And, I mean, it was pallets after pallets after pallets of shit, right? Mm-hmm. So we put some of the stuff in my backyard. Nigga had to take, there was no more room left in the garage. There was stuff all on the side of the house. I made him give me, like, plastic tarps. I didn't know how long it was going to take me to get rid of some of this stuff, but I had to go, right? So right. I dropped this shit off. They dropped my brother Jim off, James Young, some stuff off. He's, he's Easy J on Instagram. They dropped him some shit off up in the Bay Area. And I said, James, I need you to take off to Sacramento. I'm going to take off. I'm going to take off tomorrow night. As I, because I had to straighten that shit out. My, my house was looking crazy, right? I had to straighten that stuff right. out. So, so, so the following day, I rent a van. I put as much of that stuff as I could, and then I had friends at different little record shops. When I tell them to shoot me some stuff, shoot it to me. But I just took off on the tent and headed towards Texas. You see what I'm saying? Mm. And I just did it on like two wheels, man. I was just dumping that shit everywhere, just dumping it everywhere. But what I was doing, I was leaving it at point of purchase because if you give people stuff, they ain't going to really respect it. But what I told them motherfuckers was, look, I need you to sell it for $5, have it right there at your cash register as people are about to leave and they're going to look at it and go, oh, it's only $5. So that's some records cost. Remember, 10 11 12 even as high as $15. Remember that shit back then? Um, mm-hmm. So I think, but I say $5. CD or the tape, I don't give a fuck. Give it to them for $5. And I said, it's going to say, and I said, I want half of my fucking money back. I said, you're going to have to give me my money back because I'm not going to mail you no more if you don't give me my fucking money back. So that shit was working. So that's how I was paying myself, too. You see what I'm saying? Until I really get paid from Rough House slash Sony, right? Because there's a Rough House mm-hmm. record, Chris Schwartz's label, right? So right. did all that shit. My brother James did what his shit. So... I, I, I get home. I went up to Seattle. I, I did everything. I was just exhausted. So that shit took me like about two weeks and something to do to just do it. Mm. Just do every nook and fucking cranny of this bitch, right? 
because I had to get the Latino. And only somebody I was fucking with that I gave that shit away to was Latino. That was it. You understand what I'm saying? Because they knew all the gente and, and a lot of the, the slang that they were using, right? So right. And they gonna, I said, they going to get it because this motherfucker shit is hard as a motherfucker. Nigga, about, I'm home. Like about a week and a half, I'm just letting it marinate because I done took it everywhere. I couldn't even think of nowhere else to take it, right? Because it's got to break the West Coast first. It's got to break with the Latinos. So I'm sitting kind of on pins and needles. After a while, I was like, fuck that shit. I can't worry about that shit. You know, one day I get a call, and guess who's on the phone? Who's Karen that? Karen Mason. Karen Mason, Quiz Shorts, and Tommy Matola. <laughs> Oh wow, the heavy hitter! <laughs> oh, yeah, exactly, Tommy Mattel the heavy hitter the trio. Right, and and for, all three of them. And for those that don't know, Tommy Mottola at the time was the head of Sony Records. Right. So, so the whole yeah. thing the boot. That motherfucker said, "Look, Tommy Mottola said, first of all, Doug Young, I've been hearing about you. I didn't heard about you." But now I didn't just actually saw what the fuck you done. We don't know what the fuck did you do. So I ain't telling you shit. Told you I could make that motherfucking record happen. He said, oh, my God. The record is selling out now everywhere. He said, really, what did you do? I said, I'm not telling you. I don't tell you all what I did. Karen know what I did. That, tell her to tell you, but I'm not going to tell you exactly what I did. And I say, right. first of all, I tell you just this. You you marketed to the wrong people at first. Those cats is that right. Latinos. Over dope ass beats. And those niggas was mm. dope. All of them, the whole crew is dope. Y'all just did it wrong. Y'all tried to give it to white people and black people. And that was the wrong audience. And then y'all tried to go to white people first. If you don't make that shit cool with them, either the Latinos if they Latino or blacks if they black. That shit ain't got a chance with white people. They ain't fucking with it till it cross over. And then I'm right, like, I right, want right. money. I want mm-hmm. my money, so we need to figure out how much y'all going to pay. And Tommy said, don't worry about that. You're going to not only get paid. We got a new record coming out, Criss Cross, and then we got this Fuji album coming out. You're getting all of that stuff. You're getting any stuff. Look at our R&P department. This is what Tommy Matola tells me. Look over there. Whatever fuck you want to work over there, it's yours. We owe you. This is how we going to pay you for that. Oh, my fucking God. I've never seen no shit like that in my life. <laughs> That's what I mean. <laughs> play with me, nigga. Like, they don't play with me, nigga. I do this bullshit shit. Nigga, then the matter I get, the full focus I get, nigga. I'm being laser in on it. I'm going to be like, I don't get like I was doing with that Dre out there, crying out. I'm like, I don't get these, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I get these niggas all by yeah. myself. Watch. <laughs> yeah, I think I think what, what people understand about promoting records too is you knowing the sound and knowing what the people want to hear and knowing what moves. That's why they got to trust your intake more, and they almost paid the price for it. Mhm. They sure did. They sure the fuck but did. It, I mean, but I wasn't gonna let Cypress Hill go out like that though. I just that wasn't gonna happen to be honest with y'all. That wasn't going to happen. And I've seen all the shit they went through. You know, that first they got on, um, uh, what's my man's name, a Jerry Davis label. Jerry Davis had the first uh, rap record deal with Interscope. And he put out um, the rap girl, I think her name was Bahama Dia. I'm not sure. Yeah. Somebody will know who I'm talking about. But he put her out first, and I thought he made a crucial mistake. He should have put out Cypress Hill first. So that was going to help him. That's what I thought it was going to happen. So when Cypress Hill was looking around for a deal, I couldn't believe that Jerry Heller, I mean Jerry Heller, that uh, 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 Jerry Davis didn't put them out first. So they got mad as a motherfucker and left the late. And Doug, uh, it's uh, crazy because it's, it's crazy you mentioned that, Doug, in terms of how coincidental that is because guess what, the, guess what yesterday was? What? The 29th anniversary of Cypress Hill's debut album release. August oh, 13th, wow. 1991. Nice. Yeah, I, I never forget that release party. I never forget that release party. They had it at the Whiskey Go Go, right? In Hollywood, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. That motherfucking release album, it was a <laughs> release album show party where niggas got to perform. Mm-hmm. Every, every rough MC in LA was there, nigga. That was like one of the dopest release parties I've ever been to, right? Mm-hmm. That's what made it so crazy when that album wasn't doing shit. 
Nigga, we had just come back from a dope ass with the the the, the, the release party was ridiculous. Everybody in this bitch. Whole bunch of cats from New York. I mean, it was like probably one of the best. It, I would say it's in the top five best hip hop parties I ever been to in my life anywhere in the world. It was that fucking mm. Cypress Hill release album party right there on Sunset at the Whiskey, okay, uh, on the corner. So that motherfucker was just amazing. We was all so drunk. I was so drunk. I had to sleep in my car. I know I was either killed myself, killed somebody. Damn sure would have wrecked the car. And I fell asleep and woke up that next morning in my car. Because I used to uh, know a couple of people who stayed in that area, and I used to, I just went to park where they live, up way up this hill, right? Up San Vicente, right? right? And um, and I just walked down to the park. But the people that I used to know that didn't stay there anymore, that's why I just fell asleep in my car. I was just that faded after that party. Man. Now, we got to take a pause for a second, Doug, because I got to ask you this, because you're telling us the real story that it's not all glamour and glitter, that you got to hustle. What was it like back in the day to move albums? Because a lot of these artists today, these kids today, really don't understand the work and the hustle that goes into actually getting that product out there. Um, it's I mean, street teams, too. Yeah, what what was that marketing like back in the day in terms of how, you know, decisions were made in terms of how to invest in albums and, you know, projects and everything else? Because we still got to get to that Criss Cross and Fuji's project that would eventually come up later. Take us take us through that about how these decisions are made. Well, uh, actually, I, actually it's, it's funny you say this. I made that shit up as I went. What worked, I kept, what didn't, I talked. I'm the one coin to right. street team. I think I've already told you guys this, right? I coined the phrase street team. Um, right. And that came about because we we had to we had to have a PO when we set up the rap department at Capitol Records, right? So right. Joey Bailey, Joey Bailey and Steph Johnson say, Well Doug, you need a PO so we can pay the department and and and, right. and you need a name for your department. I said and then they, they wanted to call it Street Awareness Program, you know what I'm saying? Acronym SAP, you know what I'm saying? Right, right. So no, we're not gonna be no damn SAP. I said, give me. <laughs> he said, I don't. You said, and then well, SAP looks at me and said, man, I don't give a fuck. What the fuck you call you? You won't get paid. You ain't getting. You ain't getting paid till you have a name for it. So Lionel and Jeff is looking at me like, motherfuckers, you don't call this shit something so we can get this check? I said, I'll have it for you tomorrow. I have your name in the morning. I'll call it in. So by the time I drive up here, you can have all of our money ready. He said, right. bet, bet. So nigga, I'm at the house that night, like, fuck, what the fuck should I call this shit, man? I got to come up with a name for this shit. You know, I'm like, damn, maybe we're going to have to just take street awareness program. You know what I'm saying? So then I'm like, no, nigga, I'm not doing, I'm not going to be a sap. He's like, I'm going to no stop. I got a reputation up hold. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I'm not going to be no sap, right? And no, don't never say sap. Frisco to a San Francisco person. It's San Francisco. Never say Frisco, bro. Um, got you, got you. Yeah, just, got you. Uh, no problem. But look, back, so then I'm going like, sap, sap, sap. So then I go, um, what about stats? Street awareness team. Street awareness stats. Then I'm like, no. What about street team? And then I started jumping around. And I just smoked some weed, right? I'm like, yes, that's it. So I called Lionel and Jeff. I think I got the name. Okay, what the fuck the name? Street Team. They both went, that's right, that's it. Yeah. We're going to really be out there in the street, and we're going to have to make this shit happen for street level, and we're going to have to put together a team to you know, be out there to really get into the street. Because the record got to happen in the street before it goes to the radio, because remember, we didn't believe the hype then. If your record came on radio before we heard that shit in the street, uh-uh, that shit got automatically disqualified. Remember? <laughs> if we didn't hear that shit in the club, <laughs> you was automatically disqualified. Don't win by that shit. Somebody's got some money machine behind it. And that was so sad to see how we gave back the game. You know, we had it like that. With no, your record had really, you know what I'm saying, the honest, you know, word of mouth had to build your product. And 
And then when we said Street Team. And then they was like, wow, that's a great name. And guess who ended up copywriting it because of his father told him the game. This is like how it's so sad with, with a lot of us black people and, and people like we can see now, we talk about generational wealth. You know, Steve Rifkin knew that. Hey, somebody better copyright that name because you can be able to get paid off that. And remember when everybody from news station to everybody had street team? So every time that motherfucker mm-hmm. said street team is a used street team, that motherfucker Steve Rifkin gets paid. Mm. And I'm the one who came up with the fucking name. So, Steve, you need to break some of that bread, homie. You know damn well I came up with street teams. You even told your father and you tell everybody, no, but Doug Young came up with it. My dad just told me to copyright it. Cut the check, Steve. Yeah, cut the check, Steve. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Hey, man. Hey, hey, you know what, though? You know, going back to, you know, going back to your catalog of records. Now, we were dialoguing Mm -hmm. about this heavy because this was a proud moment of hip-hop. You know, we're going to jump the head for a little bit. When we started looking Mm -hmm. at Snoop Dogg and DMX's uh, Instagram battle, like versus battle. And you had to remind a lot of the people... Yeah, it was beautiful, man. You had to. Did it? Did you get a lot of memories, like nostalgia, of all those records that Snoop played because you was promoting them? Well, not only that, not only was that one of the one of the greatest, latest moments in hip hop. It was the whole cake and caboodle battle cat. It's basically coach battle cat. You know what I'm saying? I'm shooting battle cat, Texas. You better go in there, coach, and you know, pumping him up. You know, he, you know, you know, I, you know, I got this. I say, I know you got it. I'm, that, that, that whole moment was just a full circle moment, east and west. You know, everybody know all of our ups and downs that we go through just in life, and to see, you know, DMX so happy and Snoop so happy, and and I watched that thing from 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 top to bottom. What they had like three point five billion impressions and. Yeah, motherfuckers out there on, up in space, you know, Tesla rockets and shit, talking about who they had in the battle. So that just goes to show you the strength, the power, the this nigga hip hop ain't going nowhere. Knock it off. That now then opened up a whole new lane for us old niggas. Niggas thought we was dead. Nigga, we ain't dead, nigga. And like you guys seeing a lot of people like these stories. I got some things up my sleeve. I ain't talking about what I'm gonna do yet, but I got an idea um, that I'm gonna do. And it's just that that was just absolutely amazing. And then you know that took me back to me being out on the road with that Snoop album. You know, me and Kevin Blackman out there. You know, because we was the first ones out the back with it, right? And um, that shit was a trip. And it's so funny, I almost get killed in my city, San Francisco. Nigga, we make it all the way back from New York. Okay, Close Calls was in, I mean, Kevin Black, Close Calls was in Philly. We got guns pulled on us. Who was on? St. Louis. Uh, and then, nigga, almost get, I almost get killed. And Kevin wasn't even with me. Well, yes, he oh, was. Man. No, 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 I almost get killed and. My own city, Kevin was in there. Of course, he's with me. In a, a in the place they call Two Rock. Mm-hmm. Two Rock. You know that's over by where the, the Giants and the 49ers used to play in Candlestick Park, the Third Street area, right? right? That's like the I'm, last I'm of black that areas out there. Uh, that's cross town. They like you know, that's that's cross town. Fillmore mm-hmm. is where I, I grew up in San Francisco, but then I moved not over that way, but I moved towards. Uh, <clears throat> Like the Visitation Valley area when they gentrified us, uh, tricked us out of those, uh, you know, Victorian houses. Right. Like that area over there is like one of the hardest places. And, you know, you got the Visitation Valley, the projects over there is pretty hard. Yeah. <laughs> you got the Fillmore, and you got the Third Streets for the brothers, then you got the Missions for the Latinos. That ain't no right. joke. And then, you know, but um, I would say that Third Street, that, that Double Rock, we used to call it Double Rock, but it's Two Rock. And people, because I haven't been home in a long time, they check me on that. They say, I don't call that Two Rock. I mean, Double Rock no more. They call it Two Rock. Um, so let me call it for what they say it is. Man, so we, I'm up there. We're up there promoting that record, right? The, um, the mm-hmm. first Doggy Style album, right? So, nigga, I'm happy I'm at home. The Gavin Convention is there. It's going to be the last motherfucking day. Matter of fact, that's when I meet Lauren Hill. It's going to be after, nigga, almost getting killed, right? Um, hmm. So 
I was like, "Kid, let's go do this shit early because we was gonna throw this big ass party. We had we had the uh, we had the president's suite at the St. Francis Hotel. You know what I'm saying? Where the convention was being held at. We had the we had the whole upstairs death row in. Me and Kev threw apartment. I mean a party. And that's why I meet Lauren Hill. She's at the party. Everybody at that motherfucking party. Me and Lauren hang, hangs out the rest of the night. We went to the um, Patcher and Tupac show out there in the Michigan. Mm. That shit was off the hook. Nigga, that shit was only cracking. But anyway, let me back the conversation up, right? Right. Nigga, we we already went to Fillmore. We engaged shit out everywhere. I said, come on, let's just go get this last one done and double rock in. We're going to go back and just enjoy hanging out over at the Gavin Convention. This is the last Gavin Convention in San Francisco, right? So mm-hmm. we go over there. And, nigga, we up there, you know, we in the projects, we in there, you know, we in here. And it was all going good. At first, he pops the trunk open, you know what I'm saying? We had one of those big old LTD cars, you know, that, that turned into like a, a a small limousine after a while. It became that man. Right. But we used, to rent, I used to rent that car on the road, and I would rent either a Jaguar or a Mercedes. So we had, mm-hmm. that was the car for the product, and then our other car was for flossing. You see what I'm saying? We always had a floss car. And then we would usually have the hotels from the uh, the hotels that we stayed in was all five star hotels, so it gave us like a twenty mile radius to to run us around in limousines if we wanted. You see what I'm saying? I always set the shit up like that when I was out on the road. Okay. Right. So we over there, we passing the shit out. Everything's going good. You know, we passing out the, the chronic too with with the Snoop Doggy style album, right? Posters, mm-hmm. all kind of shit, flags. All of a sudden, this little one nigga come over there, and then um, he looks, you know, I gave him some shit. I said, what's up, man? And I gave him some shit, and um, and then he looks at the the the, the, the Snoop CD and the tape, and he took the shit, and he threw it over the motherfucking ground. Whoa. And stopped on it. Damn. He said, who the fuck told y'all y'all come over here and promote records? Now, mind you, my brother Jim Young tell me, nigga, you can't just be going in these neighborhoods promoting shit. And I'm thinking this nigga lost his mind. He didn't go anywhere. I want nigga. I'm go to that. want nigga. Fuck you talking about, nigga. Nigga, I snooped the old album, the hottest album, nigga, dog style, nigga, whoop, whoop, wham, whoop, whoop, right? This nigga stumps and then jump up real high like he about to dunk a basketball and broke. Snatching it out of other people's hands and breaking them. Damn. I'm like, oh, my God. So, so what, what's wrong? You can't just come. Who told you you can come up here? I said, man, I'm from San Francisco. Who, why, when? He said, you ain't from no damn San Francisco. I said, man, what you talking about? Nigga, I went, you know, because Wilson is right up the street, the high school I went to, right? I went like to Wilson High, right. nigga. I'm talking about yeah, 631 film on nigga, then moved on, back to gas and wop, wop, wop. So now I'm hitting with street, nigga. I'm on plenty there, wop, wop, wop. And then, so he's kind of calming down, and the crowd is calming down. Mike T, you know, Mike T, partner of mine, I knew that Mike stayed up on uh, a street over there somewhere, so I dropped Mike T name, and then uh, I dropped the, uh, these, these are, these are baller niggas in L, in San Francisco, right? Still, my partner's up there, right? So I dropped the Mitchells, Kim Mitchell, Will, Will, the Corky, blah, blah, blah. And then this nigga talking shit, then I said, nigga, hey, Black, give me the phone. Let me call Shelly. Let me call Tatum, something. And then, dude, he just, like, paused. He said, you know the Taylor. I said, yeah, nigga, shit, nigga, that's my motherfucking people, nigga. Nigga, you go over here trying to press up on niggas like you talking about, nigga. Nigga, hold on for a minute. He said, you know Shelly? I said, yeah, I know Shelly. What the school with the nigga? We graduated with what was the world? 19, 17, nah, what nigga? I'm trying to talk to this cat off this tour truck. Because, nigga, as this nigga jumped up, I see the nigga had a burner on him, right? Our burner's in the uh-huh. glove box and underneath the seat. So we butt asshole naked out the car. You see what I'm saying? So uh, right. So, so I'm thinking fast, and now I'm calming me down. So guess what I'm doing? Nigga, I'm putting the trunk down. You know, how you can put the trunk down, and I'm waving the black like, like get your ass to the car, get your ass to the car. Yeah, nigga, you get on the phone with Shell. Hold on, man, cause I mean, let me see that other number Shell had. Nigga, I ain't calling nobody, right? <laughs> uh, uh, Shelly Tatum, you know, I'm constantly nigga Tatum's nigga. They ain't gonna be playing with this shit. Nigga, call the snake Kim Mitchell, cause these niggas are certified. You know, them, them niggas up there, right? So, right. So then I t- kept close the motherfucking door. But, nigga, I went nose first in. I parked nose first instead of backing the car in, right? 
because you got to press. Mm-hmm. It was like parallel park. It wasn't like, you know, you park on the street, right? So, nigga, I'm backing out of there and then chilling everybody out, passing more stuff out the window because now people was taking the product again. And then as I'm backing the car out, I'm backing the car out, right? Dude must have thought about it. And then he went back on one. But by this time, all the crowd is clear. I'm rolling away. But I hadn't been in Double Rock or Two Rock in a long time, right? So I'm not sure mm-hmm. if I not go left because it's going to be a dead end one way, right? So I'm like, should I not? Should I go left or right? Left or right? Which one do I do? Because right? I, I knew this, right? But I couldn't remember. So my dumb ass make a left. I'm like, oh, no, Jamestown is the other way because that's the street Mike stayed on, Jamestown, towards the uh, Candlestick Park, right? Because uh, now I'm punching them. I'm like, nigga, you went the wrong way. So, nigga, I did a scar skin hutch motherfucking U-turn on that motherfucking car and punched it. You can see that motherfucker rolled up. Mm-hmm. Nigga, as soon as I punched it, them niggas is now running down towards us because they know we done went the wrong way and they was... Nigga, them niggas got that dumping like a motherfucker at us, nigga. And nigga, I get up on Jamestown, bust that right, nigga, shoot down the street, um, and then just go go over, hopped on that motherfucker freeway, nigga, and was the hell out of Dodge. Hopped on that motherfucker one on one. I couldn't fucking believe that. Nigga, I sat in my fucking hotel room like, nigga, you almost got killed where you were from. What the fuck just happened? And that and shit was going all on the news. Yeah, Doug, how did those politics play out out there? I mean, you know, y'all. Oh no, that, 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 no, that shit be, became everywhere. Everybody after a while, nigga, you couldn't just go promote no record because it's like you 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 short stopping their money. And everybody now got rappers. And then you got drug crews that's putting rappers on. And that's the right, way that my right. brother explained it to me. You got niggas that's spending their money. They ain't going to let you come in there. It's like you don't try to sit in front of a drug dealer's house and shortstop his money, nigga, see what happens, nigga. And get your head. <laughs> Makes <off>. sense. <laughs> Makes sense. And then, you know, you got this is Snoop and Dre. They, they're like, them niggas that's eating. If you don't get that shit out of here, basically, we trying to eat. You know, um, how have you seen the market change in terms of promotions, man? Because, I mean, this is, I mean, because back in the day, um, even from a street reputation and the gang, uh, gang ties, because we know about, you know, uh, you know, we know about EZE and NWA. We know about DJ Quick. You know, we know about Compton's Most Wanted. We know about Trag New, Kelly Park, you know, uh, Tree mm-hmm. Top, Pyru. Um, and now we're just, seeing this uh, proliferation of now where it's become, because back in the day, if you were really on the block like that, that was something you were kind of keeping low key because you were really right. trying to legitimize your hustle and you weren't trying to let everybody know what was really happening. And now it's like you got a lot of these artists today that are just reveling in the fact that like they're street guys being up at all up in the videos, showing dope, you know, flashing guns, like just shouting out everything. It's like, what do you think it started changing up at? Well, I mean, a friend of mine from Chicago put it best, Shorty Capone. Uh, he had, um, uh, what's them guy's name? They rap real fast. Um, um, uh, Crucial Conflict? Yeah, Crucial was it, uh, Conflict. Was the, group. Was no, no, it was Crucial the, Conflict. Uh, Crucial Conflict. Okay. That's his group. Right. That's Shorty's group. Shorty, my man. Matter of fact, Shorty is how... I found Danny Boy. Shorty wanted, when we was out there, Shorty wanted to meet with me, so he paid Kevin Black to come have me meet with him when we was out there promoting the Snoop album, right? So right. then me and Shorty came to this second, to this day, to this minute, right? And um, Shorty said it best. He said, um, because, you know, like, I was feeling some type of way after a while of, damn, they got to help spread this gang culture. Um, because... I remember one time being in New York. I'm with the 45 King, right? Right. And we go over to New Jersey. And, nigga, it was like a blood explosion out there. This is before really the gangbang, before it really took off in New York. It was in in Newark and all in in New Jersey. You see what I'm saying? Now, now, 
Yeah. Right, and I and, mm-hmm. and I want to say this while I was on my mind uh, because because uh, I know you got way more uh, knowledge on this than uh, we do on it. But I know around the time this is around the time OG Matt because he's credited with bringing the United Blood Nation to the East Coast, and he was born in L.A. Um, so I guess this is so well. That was more. Like, I think that, that I, I think that is hold on. I think that is true, but I think that was more of a prison blood. That it was, was like the old way we yeah. said blood. I think that was like the old way we said it. I'm talking when the right. L.A. game. Let's see, let me finish what Shorty said. Let me finish what Shorty said. Shorty right. made the most sense of it. He said, Doug, think about it. You know why people really gravitated to y'all and we didn't? Keep, and remember, Chicago is the only one who still don't got no Crips and Bloods out there. That's it. Everybody else do. You see what I'm saying? He said, look, y'all got a car, mm-hmm. which is those low riders with them rims on them. You know what I'm saying? That y'all car can even do a dance. Y'all have a dance. Y'all got a uniform. He said, that's like a military. He said, y'all got a car, a dance, in a way y'all talk with y'all hands. Y'all got ways that you got to go about it. He said, that's what made it look glamorous to everybody and explode the way it did. And that made absolutely the most sense that I've ever heard. And, and it's did, crazy, it Doug. Exploded. And it's crazy you say that, Doug, because you figure, like you said, Chicago, of course, as the gangster disciples and the vice lords, those are the two most predominant. But you figure in the early 1990s that would bring the alliance because of some beef. I believe it was because the Crips had migrated to St. Louis, and I believe, yeah. of course, Chicago. You had, uh, of course, vice lords because all through the Midwest, you had it through Wisconsin, you had it through. Um, all, uh, Missouri, Kansas, all of that. So what you had is, I think it started because those uh, those lines started getting drawn on um, on a uh, team up because I think it was a blood set out there that was getting overran uh, by a crip set, and that's when the bloods, if I got my story right, um, that's when they teamed up with the vice lords, and by proxy, the GDs teamed up with the crips. So that's where you started having folk nation and people nation. You know the four right. point start, the five point start, and the six star. So that's where you started seeing that blow up out there. So that's why, for those that don't know, that's why you have a lot of the uh, vice lords. They um their auxiliary, their sister uh, group, you know, are bloods. While about the gangster disciples, the GD, they're aligned with Crip. Um, well, I mean, you, hold, 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 hold on, let me, let me interject here. I think Ice Cube. Kind of got yeah, really my, my, my the summer actual uh, uh, my the, summer the summer vacation. It be because of the drug trade. Because you guys got to remember, at one point in time in the LA drug trade, right? The, the keys right. are so cheap there. You, well, nobody makes no money, and everybody named Mama was selling dope. But you took that right. shit out of town, right? If you took that shit out of town, you was making four, five times your money, especially with the pure shit. Because at, at one time, blacks had the dope game, remember? Before the Latinos. And then niggas right. started robbing and stealing from each other. The niggas had the, the dope game. At the early part of that 80s, the niggas had the dope game. And then the yep. niggas wasn't doing right by them Colombians and robbing and doing that shit that niggas <clears> do. <throat> and what happened was, and then something happened in Miami where, you know, they a lot of their shipments was getting stopped. So the, well, that was the border the became during that time, Griselda Blanco and all of them. Exactly, and then guess what? Yeah. Then it migrated to Tijuana, the tunnels that we even have to this day, this way. The Tijuana and cartel, then, the Medellin cartel, yeah, right. the Cali cartel. Yeah. yeah, the Cali cartel. Right. You see what I'm saying? So, but then that the prices was, was so cheap right. here, you had to go out of town. And who was the best people to protect your money out of town? You send professional drug dealers, gangbangers. They became, yep. they was basically your professional drug dealers. Okay? And they came, they went crude up, and motherfuckers, and they wasn't about all that fighting. You see what I'm saying? Nah, niggas straight and dumping. Niggas in, <laughs> yep, exactly. And then niggas in those neighborhoods started, you know, wanting to be like them and talking about places they are and they never seen in their life. Like, like uh, Nipsey Hussle say, nigga, you guys got to come to the Mecca if you're really talking about that, you trying to do that retardo stuff. But I just thought that after a while, it, it just was something that I was like, damn, man. Especially during them death row years, man. Like, this shit is out of control. It's a mess. Oh, my God. What the fuck did I help do, you know? 
But, you know, I'm past that now. It is what it is. Um, well, you know, and, 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 you know, and dwelling, you know, and going back on the good times, because, you know, I think with Death Row, it gets a lot of the, the you know, the fuckery that they've been through, that gets more of the attention and the clout, and they don't really reflect on the on the good time and the presence that the, that they made on the culture. Yeah, I mean, because, because, it, because it was fun. Yeah, it was man. a lot of fun. But it, was, it was a lot of fun at first. It was a lot of fun. I used to just like watching now, it. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask you, like, what was your favorite of uh, the soundtracks? Was it, did you like the Murder with the Case one or more Above the Rim? Oh, Above the Rim. Yeah, not even close. Down. Not even, down. not even close. That last Freaknik out there in Atlanta. That would always remind me of that Above the Rim. I had so much fun out at that freak thing, even though we got shot at a few times and got chased through Nike <laughs> Town. It was like something like uh, two million people was out there. <laughs> and I almost missed the flight back because I had a don't this die, do not disturb on my. That freak Nick was the most incredible freak Nick. And you know that Atlanta never let them have no more after that moment. <laughs> that was 1994. Because I mean. 1994, nigga. Like, Man, that shit that was the shit. Nigga, you could, and check we was, remember, 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 you couldn't even go, yeah. you couldn't even go twenty feet. It took what a couple of hours to go twenty feet. Remember? Yeah. <laughs> 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 it, took, <laughs> it took two hours to go twenty feet. You was wasting your time if you drove your car. It was a waste of time. What? Is I mean, that shit was so fucking amazing and dangerous. Fun at the same time. That was the most yeah. the prettiest black people on the planet out that bitch. The we were in high school at the time. Um, I'm 42. <laughs> uh, don't mind saying it. And we heard the I'm, we heard I'm the legend of Freakness. Yeah, I'm 58. We heard the legend. And check this out. We was the shit. We are the. We come there with the. The uh, above the rim soundtrack. That's yeah. all you heard coming out of car. That's it. <laughs> now imagine me, Nicky. Imagine me and Kevin Black floating around that bitch like we was the king of everything. The man got man. above the rim jackets, t-shirts, all kind of shit. Got the tank top t-shirts above the rim, you know, jerseys, right? Shitloads of product. Man, you know, we was over there at the. Uh, we standing right across the street from Nike Town. What's that fucking hotel again? The um, you got the, the Negro down the street. Now the Omni done changed so many times. That used to be the Nico. You talking about the one down the street from one club on twelve or up the street, whatever. Gotcha. No, no, I'm talking about the Rich, no Rich Carlton. We're at the because Rich Carlton, my room, I can look directly at Nike Town. That that little strip mall. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was at the Rich Carlton, nigga. Baddest room in that bitch. I had it. And we was the shit. Niggas got so bad, I had to have, like, I had, like, three rooms. Niggas was constantly trying to find a nigga. And then I, I put a do not disturb on my name. I had all kind of fake names. And cause after a while, niggas going to know I'm there, so they going to automatically ask for Doug Young. You know what I'm saying? So I say, mm-hmm. people call me. And asked for Doug Young, he did not stand at this hotel. I said, this is going to be the name I want to use. And if somebody just so happens, it's going to be a no, you know, these little things you can do, like do not disturb on your phone. That means don't even call nobody. Don't even let nobody let a call come in. And then at that time, you know, we got cell phones anyway, but that's how motherfucking people try to sneak attack you, you know, want to give you a record or some girl you may have been messing around in the city with. They trying to find you and all kind of shit, you know. I think it was a time when they had so many big records on there, too. It had SWV, Anything. You had the Dog Pound Joint, Big Pimpin'. You had Pac with Pour Out a Little Liquor, Afro Puff. That was, mm-hmm. was a dope soundtrack. The two things. Uh, no, the, joint, the joint with Tretch, Riddler, and Tupac, Loyal to the Game. 
is like one of my absolute favorites off of there. And then another thing, mm-hmm. why the hell didn't they use the original Rage version on Above the Rim soundtrack for the video? Because I love that vid- that album version was, who? why did they do the remix as opposed to the original? Oh, I mean, that's, you know, I mean, after a while, people be overthinking that. And you got to understand that that was shared with Warner Brothers, so that wasn't all death row. You gotcha. know what I'm saying? Okay, okay. Yeah. And um, matter of fact, remember, that was one of the reasons why that last time I was on y'all's show was talking about Tommy, I mean, uh, Benny Medina and shit, remember? Yeah. That was, one of, yeah. That, was, that, was one of, that was one of the little incidents that flared that stuff off with that L incident. Yeah. You yeah, know? man. Oh, I forgot. Of course, you got, I had to add, I forgot I had to put regulate. That was the monster right there. Regulate. Yes, it was. Oh, that that's was the and then, and then it's like, how you don't get Warren G a deal after regular? I don't know what it was. Problem Sugar and Warren G was. I never got that. That was kind of salty the way they did do. But then, then Paul turns around and starts Def Jam West. Paul Stewart signed him, and not sure want to be mad at Paul Stewart. Man. So, I mean, but that whole era was just wild, man. So we're still in the 90s, so we want to backtrack a little bit from the conversation because what you said earlier about how, you know, we talked to Tommy Matola, you know, with the Crisscross Project, because this is uh, coming up on Rough House, So So Deaf, Columbia. This is when Jermaine Dupree is beginning to drop that. The Fuji's right. album uh, will end up coming out in 1994, blended on reality. Uh, mm-hmm. But, of course, um, so what was – so take us through that time in terms of what was happening with that period. What was, um, were you involved? How much were you involved in those projects where you kind of just, you know, well, I, I, I them. I them up, I, I, you know, like I told you, that was my reward for gotcha. saving the Cypress Hill project. So I just gotcha. got the so boot the- I had my run. They, they knew I was going to do my thing. You know, the Fuji, right. the buildup of them was, that was pretty, some things are just layups. You know, after the, after the crisscross, uh, make you want to jump, that was a layup, right. you know. So certain things is easy after a while. The Fuji's was just so anticipated; it was ridiculous because of Lauren Hill alone. You know what I'm saying? Right. Because um, that was coming off the Sister Act uh, when she was in Sister Act. Exactly. Exactly. Sister Act. Right. So Sister Act those, two. Those, Sister Act those, two, those yeah. projects was pretty easy. Those projects was pretty easy. It wasn't no real, real promotion there. Like the Cypress Hill record was real, real promotion. Those are the challenges. I like that type of shit. Everybody's doubting. People don't hear it. People don't do it. I love that. But, you know, Criss Cross was, that was a layup. You know, kids, catchy, you know. Matter of fact, that wasn't the first record I worked for Jermaine Dupree. Jermaine Dupree had a, actually a label at Guessing first, and he had this group called Silk Times Leather. I, that was the first group I worked for with Jermaine Dupree. And I think he was only like 15 or 16 years old then. Yeah. You know, and, and yeah. wild up because when you look at it, with um, this is a rap trivia for those that don't know. Jermaine Dupree was the youngest producer ever at 17 years old to have a platinum album, and nobody has ever done that since. Um, yeah, I'm about to say because I know he was a little old kid when I used to see him up at that desk, and I thought he was like, I'm not going to lie, 15 or 16, so he was 17, I guess. Huh? But he's always yeah, he was 17. Dude. Yeah, right, and, so and the thing dude. is, and the and I know the Fuji's album blended on reality. You know, I know that was a tricky deal because it was because when they first had the first single "Boof Boss," I know that was met, mixed with Luke, met with lukewarm reviews. But it wasn't until they did the Salam Remy remix of uh, "Nappy Heads." That's the joint that right. kicked down the door that would really set it up. Um, right. What was that marketing like for the Fuji's? Was that how, how was that in terms of really trying? Because uh, they were kind of, you know, kind of. Well, no, a lot of that stuff was no, no, a lot that that was kind of easy because remember before then, before they really, really exploded, you you had Native Tongue that came out of the East Coast in the late eighties. Right, Jungle Brothers, really the Flavor Unit. You had Native Tongue, Tribe Called Quest. You know, you had Native Native Tongue. You know, you already had that. Right. So it was already set for something like that. What the Fuji's did, they turned it more into, of course, rap, meeting more reggae, and with a twist of now people would say like an Erica Badu Jewish because of Lauren had just all of those versatile skills, you know what I'm saying? So now right. you got the neo soulish. They 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 had like this just this fly ass flavor, 
And then, like I was telling you, after that shit happened at um, after that shit happened in San Francisco, that night I meet Lauren Hill at the party we gave for Snoop. You know, mm-hmm. at the St. Francis, and me and her ended up hanging out the whole day, and she just was down to earth as going to be. We had so much fun, fun hanging out, and, and she was singing a lot of that stuff a cappella for me. She was killing it. And then I remember me and her, we go to the Domino Show. The Domino Show was, where was that show at? I think it was down at, at the, somewhere near the Lone Sherman Hall. And that's, that, that's in Fisherman's Wharf area of San Francisco, right? And I'm just going to leave it there. The show was, huh. But me and her, you know, she 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 just dope. And she was just showing me some of the stuff that they was doing. And shit, man, that stuff was dope, you know? Because they was up next, mm. basically. It was up next. And that score album did like and that score album was like probably one of the biggest sellers of ninety six. I think it did like Diamond. Yeah. Yeah. Because it was just well rounded, it was musical. You had a lot of old R and B women that loved that album because of Lauren. You know, and you had a lot I mean, of people. Because I know, because uh, I know part of the issues with it. Because I know when uh, Blunted on Reality didn't do so hot, that was the album. Basically, they were just given a budget. I think it was one hundred and twenty-five, hundred fifty thousand. Uh, they just gave, uh, you know, um, what you call it, um, Y Clef, and they were just told them like, just, just go ahead and do what you do. Um, yeah, that was that know, was uh, that was the average price for budgets back then. I never got none of them alone. I'm on Ricky Dink ass budgets. My shit started at two, two fifteen, three. You know, Ricky Dink. And then the motherfuckers in New York used to get them fifty and seventy five thousand dollar budgets. I could not fucking believe that. Nigga, I got more than that for just promo for <laughs> promo one single, nigga. Get your motherfucking ass. Is that motherfucker gonna get your motherfucking ass away from me? This goddamn crumbs. What am I supposed to do with that? <laughs> oh yeah. Especially with all that big money they were getting in the nineties too. Oh, that's chump change. Yeah, man, dude, dude. I'm see one of the things about me. After getting up there like at MCA and Capital, I knew the money that was in them fucking budgets, nigga. So you're not right. playing with me. You're not talking to no fucking idiot when you're talking to me. I need all mine because I know I'm gonna bring something to the table. This motherfucking record right. ain't gonna make a dime until I start doing something with it. So I need mine. You know what I'm saying? And I need it up front. I mean, and that's and that's business because you know when you're looking at that time, um, I know when we grow, you know, with us, we're all looking back at those days. Um, it's not us trying to say, you know, that we're the best. We just grew up in the best era, hands down. I mean, um, oh, the nineties, the nineties, the nineties, the late eighties and the nineties. That 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 can never re- be recaptured. No, that I remember meeting my wife. You know, one of the things that me and my wife used to fight about a lot. She used to always say to me, "Well, you, your daughters, time you come back, they didn't prove blah blah blah, and, and you act like you don't miss something out there." And my 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 first wife Ellie was probably all of five two, and I would mumble mm-hmm. under my breath. I would mumble under my breath. I am. <laughs> and you just felt that. You felt if you, if I wasn't somewhere in the world at a show, a convention, because I done been all over the world so many times because of hip hop, right? And all of them classic battles, you know, like stuff like, I can't even imagine not being there when Melly Mel got the belt took by Mikey D and Karis one was the master of the ceremony at that seminar that year. And we turned that motherfucking place out in the lower village by that little heroin park, right? Give back the belt. Some of those seminar moments, just some of those um, DMC championship, Oktoberfest moments, and all the little other little things that they would have all around the world battles, and you know what I'm saying? I really did think I would miss some. I catch the tail end of the Latin Quarter, you know, upstairs records. I mean. Downstairs records that was really upstairs, you know what I'm saying? Um, where all the bricks came from, and 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 I, and I did. I used to be like a fly on the wall in the 45 King's house because everybody is going in and out of that house. Remember, 
He produced for everybody from Jay Z. Everybody used to be in that motherfucking dude's house. To Diamond D, to as y'all know him, everybody, Madonna, Lenny Kravitz, everybody, this dude had like four or five apartments in New York. You know, and I used to go out to Nails every Thursday. You know, that's when fashion started meeting hip hop. You know, I had to mm-hmm. be in Nails, or I'm at the Payday at Patrick Moxie's club. That's why I first gave away the first advanced cassette of America's Most Wanted Ice Cube album that the Bomb Squad just done. I see them left NWA. Motherfucking come running down, rushing down the stairs after me. After they see Cool Keith goes up in there and tells them, you know, because I gave, I saw Cool Keith going in the, in, into there and said G from Ultra Magnetic, man, and I gave them some taste. They went up in the club, and I'm just out there passing them out. All of a sudden, I see a crowd of motherfuckers coming down them up on white stairs. It was in this fly-ass white building, looked like the courthouse in New York, right? Patrick Markey had one of the baddest clubs ever called the Payday, right? And nigga... About 60, 70 motherfuckers out there, and I'm like, what the fuck? Is something happening in the club? Them niggas is running towards me to grab that fucking Ice Cube America's Most Wanted classic album. I got the advanced mm. sets of it. The record ain't coming out until like four or five days. I'm there on Thursday. That's when they was dropping records on Tuesdays because Nell was on. No, I'm, I'm there on Wednesday. Patrick is on Wednesday. So I get there early to go to Patrick Moxie's party on a Wednesday. Nell's on Thursday. So I said, let me, because I got the advanced cassette that Tuesday. Then I, and, you know, I just made my reservation that night, you know, because I would work, you know, whatever place I make them do the reservation. And I'm going tonight. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay at the Wellington or whatever hotel I make, you know what I'm saying? Sheraton, New York or whatever. Mm-hmm. I mean, book, book me a flight. I'm going out tonight. I got this very Christmas one. Had like three boxes of it, right? Of just the advanced cassette. Didn't have no CDs or nothing, just cassettes, right? And um, fly out there, and that motherfucker just bum rushing. I see Russell, Leor, everybody flying out the club to grab some shit. And before I knew it, man, I'm just bowled over, and every box is empty. <laughs> and that shit, man. I mean, I, I can't even explain it. It was like. I mean, and then just sitting up there watching them make the chronic. It was like, you didn't really want to never leave because you thought you was going to miss something and miss some verses. And that shit was fun. Even though everybody up there was broke, and we had the most fun of our lives up at that solar building, dude. I used to see them little young motherfuckers hopping around. At first, I was like, when I left Ruthless, right, I was like, man, mm-hmm. fuck, you got to start over and shit, these young-ass fucking kids. And I first went up there, right? And I never forget, I always know we're 10 years apart. I remember asking Sue, how old are you? He said, I'm 18. Come on. Right. And then I'm 28. So that's why I always will know Snoop's birthday. Because we was 10 years apart. I'm like, oh, God. I mean, they were kids. But then after a while, I started seeing how dope they were. And then I couldn't wait to get up there, and, you know, doing all kind of crazy shit to keep that thing in the air because Sony wouldn't, Sony wouldn't put it out. So... You know, getting the source to come out, talking to Dave, I mean, talking to Dave Mays and John Schechter, that's before Benzino came. But I was one of their first writers when they, him and John lived in the dorms in Harvard, at Harvard. When the first couple of issues looked at like a Chinese food magazine, me and Greg Mack were like <laughs> the first writers. So I called them, them to send, send a writer out because it looked like Sony was playing games because the record was finished, right, to review the album. They sent out Ronan Ron, who ends up writing Have Gun Will Travel. Right. Who right, who has ends up writing Have Gun Will Travel when Lee Savage gets the idea to make Welcome to Death Row, which actually I talked to Lydia Harris the other day, just catching up with her. And her and Mike brings me in to help fix the Welcome to Death Row that Lee Savage makes that then's gonna turn into the straight out of Compton move. You see what I'm saying? Right. So Mm-hmm. I've had a great time in this industry. I mean, my record don't even don't even looks like it's believable. You're like, no, this nigga can't be done all that. Shit. Yep, sure did. And it was because nope. I just wanted to do it. Now I wanted to shoot you this about uh, Dr. Dre because I've been hearing about this about him for about a, like twenty something years, and it's about him like allegedly not producing. Now, can you? Break down the difference between a producer and a beat maker. Actually, 
I was having this conversation with somebody just the other day. Um, this, this is what it is. Trey is one of the baddest producers. Get the fuck out of here. That shit's some bullshit, okay? But he do get assistance. And therein lies what people splits and quarters and all of that other shit is. But at the end of the day, he puts on the final touches. Uh, because, like, remember when they had high power over at Rufus, for instance, right? Him and Yellow Boy, right? Right. Yellow Boy came up with a lot of those yeah. skits. And then, be honest with you, uh, a big uh, 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 Dirt Bike Donovan came up with a lot of that because he was the engineer, but Donovan was helping them really because he came from the rock world. You see what I'm saying? So I'm going to give you his origins mm -hmm. from the I did that Juice album, remember, with Lonzo on Crew Cut. And then you can see him now growing when he did the Michelle A. And before you turn off the lights, you can see he's getting better at syncing. But it was always something, even when I picked that Juice album, because I didn't know Lonzo or Dre or none of them niggas, from Adam when I went in there and got that job that day. Remember I told you all about it? And I just listened to the Juice, and I liked it, that Juice record, you know? Um, it was just something about the way he was blending those beats that I had never really heard before, and it had this, this musicianal touch. Because remember, I'm around musicians at first, and I first see kid, I'm like, I'm around the bars. I'm now around Prince and Rick James and all of these musicians and George Clinton and all of those cats, okay? So... Babyface and, uh, and all of them, I'm around them. You see what I'm saying? So, Dre, first of all, is special, okay? If Dre really puts his heart into something like the DLC, the Michelle A album, the Snoop album, his first Chronic album, I went around, and Kevin had the, 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 the second Chronic album. You know, I didn't bounce on the business, but that's just bullshit. The way that Dre... Dre layers, Dre stacks like a actual real old school R and B James Brown meets the bars, meets meets Marvin Gaye. If you really look at how the Isley brothers meets um uh what's his name? Uh, Larry Graham meets um um Sly the Family Stone. You see what I'm saying? The way that that motherfucker stack his shit the way that he mixes shit, the way that he EQ that shit, can't nobody else do that shit but Dre like that. Get the fuck out of here. Uh, you know, I hear people talking about he stole this and he stole that. Man, maybe he took the idea from my folks because niggas do that all the time. I'm sorry. And then um, I remember I used to hear from rappers back in the 80s and 90s talking about somebody took their idea and it's, no, it's somebody that can beat your ass out with the sample. Nigga, you niggas that took the shit from other records. Fuck y'all talking about now. You want to talk about somebody stealing your shit. So a lot of that stuff was semantics. It's semantics. You know. Right. Yes, Wordplay. Um, yeah, it, it is. It's semantics. Yes, cocaine and, and, and above the law, them, them niggas did create g -Funk. That's why they had that right. issue with Warren G and all of those niggas. That is a fact. Okay. But Dre will take somebody's style or he'll see something in what they're doing and then he will do something to it. I can't explain it. You see what I'm saying? So then you you, you now go into like what they would say when you, um, like fashion, right? In order not mm -hmm. to be sued for a copyright in fashion, you got to have three distinct things that don't look like this. I'll give you a great example. I always explain this to people. Remember the uh, the the, uh, the K Swift and yeah. the Adidas. Adidas can't sue right. K Swift because they got five stripes, right? Adidas right. got two, right? Oh, they got six stripes. Mm -hmm. That third, those three stripes made it where you can't be sued. So, and, and what I'm saying to you is this: most things that you think of, and I don't give a fuck what it is, is let it rather be technology because I come from Silicon Valley, going to San Jose State. Rather it be music, rather just be ideas. If you think of something, at that moment you think of something and it's not out there, I guarantee you probably 100 people then after you think of it per day think of that same thing. Now it's going to be the first person to be, that put that shit out. It's going to beat everybody to the punch. 
That's why, remember, you got to mm. go do search when you're looking for names, when you go do patents, when you when you coming up with a name for a company. You got to go down to your office. Like, we got the one up there in, uh, Nor- uh, what is that, Norwalk? Well, you got to go look to see if anybody got that motherfucking name on that old school microfilm. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Before you yeah. even come up with the name of your motherfucking business before you even register. Yeah, you know, Doug, you that's, go- real, that's, that's, that's real talk because I want to say, um, and anybody can check me, you know, on YouTube, whatever, if I'm wrong, but I think this is how I, I think this is what happened with Black Label, the clothing company, uh, because Black Label ended up going out a few years back because it was actually, I believe, a skateboard company that had trademarked the name in 1991. And, um, right. you know, it was a, yeah, and then the label, and then, of course, the clothing label resurfaced in the late 2000s, but then when they, you know, of course, the copyright, they hadn't cleared that copyright in terms of the name, and then they had to close shop. Right. Because they, right, yeah. So, uh, and what I'm saying to you is, you know, okay, it's so funny when you were talking about this is, uh, the, the example I was explaining to somebody else is like the blade was going to be a so-called rip, but Dre was halfway out the door was going to be the Tupac out. At first, they was going to front like he did most production. We all know that he did that production with the exception of California Love. He's probably going to go in there and tweak some of the stuff, mix some of the stuff, but for the most part, Daz did that fucking California Love. I mean, that uh, right. all eyes on me. You see what I'm saying? And And it's just Sometimes, um, in order to get in, niggas gonna steal your shit. Puffy and them niggas do that shit all the time. Claim that they produce something, they ain't produce shit. Hmm. Well, that's the truth. Yeah, like, yeah, like, got my mind made up, a bitches as a rider, scandalous. Oh, that's what it's on. Major oh, work for that album. Yeah, that's <clears> quick, and I guess that was fucking, you know what I'm saying? Quick did some shit, and. And then when 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 Pac came home, niggas was giving them all the best beats and songs. If you had a motherfucking shit that was gonna be a hit for you, not no more, nigga. Everything had to go to Pac. <laughs> just what happened, niggas would tell you that's what happened. But some of that stuff is you know you get in the door, like you know after years, I mean, wasn't mad at Georgia. Georgia got me in the door, nigga. I don't fuck, I'm here a week. I'm in Jackson's house. You see what I'm saying? That was me getting in the door, you know. So after a while, when you mature and when you start seeing, hmm, if this wouldn't happen, that wouldn't happen. You see what I'm saying? So, you know, certain things you got to just take, keep it moving. Right. Because this, 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 this is a dirty game. You, the, the music business is a dirty game, huh? Full of chicken shit, shameless, backstabbing, greedy motherfucker. Period. Still want to get in that business? No. Nah, well, come on. Now let me shoot this. I'm gonna shoot this to you too. I just had this question submitted. Like, do you believe that it was a it was a plot by the industry to get Suge Knight out of here, or do you think yeah. what yeah. he's done is like That's okay? No, I, I, I answered the question. Yep, yeah. Suge was doing too much. That's why I had to get out of there. Was doing way too much. It was too much gang banging going down. It was, see, you niggas only know about a few murders. It was a gang of murders, dude. We, Jim now, Jim. Was this before, was this before or after Tupac? Because when we watched the Death Row documentary, oh, way before see. Tupac, way before Tupac. Got you. Way got before you. Tupac. I mean, the shit, the shit, the shit got out of control. That's why I left. I mean, I'm no scary mm-hmm. nigga. I would stay. If it, I would have never left, ruthless. If Dre wouldn't have left, I mean, you know, ruthless. Now, you know, you know, they had hard niggas, but ruthless had sense. The shit. After a while, that death row was just senseless shit. And it was right. real gang banging going down. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, it's man. Real no, niggas now, it, 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 it's real niggas now trying to, you know, nigga, some days I was going to the lobby, bro, every, if you go in that lobby some days, it's all these niggas always fresh out of prison make a beeline to the company. Blood niggas. Whole lobby be full of blood niggas smoking Newports. That they didn't broke the filter off or camels, like they sitting around like like when I'm like I've been in county jail and shit all the times out here, right? And then sometimes you know like when you come out of your cell and shit, or you had them niggas down there. This is back like I've been going to county jail since I got out of here in '80. 
where we could smoke in jail. And then you have some niggas that are so institutionalized, all they do is just sit there all day, smoke, gossiping, talking shit. And that's how that day room in, 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 in death row was. Just a bunch of football playing looking motherfuckers sitting on super swole, all killers and drug dealers. Niggas up there robbing motherfuckers left and right. They come there for meetings, taking people cameras. I remember one time they stole the whole motherfucking um, NBC. <laughs> they had like one of them. Um, they had like one of them. Um, you know them news like a like I was on a um, prime time live. You know like one of those type of shows. You know what I'm saying? Right. With that white with that white lady. They they, were, they robbed them and took everything. Everything, including her purse. All them expensive mm-hmm. ass cameras and you see what I'm saying? Them big ass suitcases worth of shit. They took everything. Them niggas went to lunch and they was talking about she was gonna be there, coax them out there, go ahead, we're gonna watch this stuff and they got back, nigga wasn't nothing there. And then they used to come up there niggas trying to get on their throat, just straight rival. You know, and one thing about it, Doug, is that, you know, people really don't understand because we got a lot of artists today, uh, <laughs> six nine, trying to talk about, you know, that um, trying to talk about how they really active out there. But back in the day, I mean, the nineties was really a dangerous time. Bro, you know, nineties yeah, got, got nothing on the eighties when the cocaine really hit hit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Man, he's got nothing on the 80s, bro, in L.A., at least in L.A. L.A. was ridiculous. L.A., Crenshaw, you better keep your head on a motherfucking swivel when the niggas had the 5.0s and the Nissan trucks and the Suzuki Samurai and the Dooleys and them uh, Wagoneers, shit, them Astro Vans, nigga, and that, what was that, 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 that Nissan truck, shit, shit, nigga, that shit. Nigga, a shooting could happen anywhere, and it did all the fucking time in the 80s. That's when gangbanging just took off, bro, out here. Everybody agree with that. I think yeah. I think for like five or six years in a row, L.A. was the murder capital of the world. Yeah, I think uh, that I know I know uh, want to stay out here in Richmond, Virginia. We had it, um, I think, because I know Richmond, California, and Richmond, Virginia, I believe, for a couple of years in the 90s, began to take that over. Um, you know, oh, yeah. all the different reasons. Yeah, but it's cool. Yeah, not, you know, not, to you say, know. not to mention, not to mention, you being a new rapper at the time, and you had to fly out to L.A. and check in with Shug, and when he was the top dog, I know that had to be a bitch. Oh, no, no, niggas was scared to come out here, nigga. That nigga was robbing, and his crew was robbing everything moving. That's why they took everything out of it. It just got bad. That's why they took him down. It got it got real bad, man. I mean, it got real bad. It got it got, you know, it's, it's quite a few things. You know, I ain't gonna even say on no this interview. But let's put it like this, dude. It got horrible. It got it got where I just didn't even want to do it no more. Man. That was good. I remember when um. I was plotting my end game. It's funny we talked about the freak nick earlier, right? Mm-hmm. I almost missed the flight. I almost missed the flight, right? And then I paid this cab driver because nigga, you still couldn't move. Everybody trying to go to the airport at that on that day. Remember, like it took like when I was talking about um, two hours to go twenty feet. It was still that right. way that morning. So I paid this motherfucking cab driver four hundred dollars if he just. Ruled. Rode on the side of the freeway and got me to the airport. And that motherfucker did. <laughs> I would have missed that flight, man. I would have missed the flight. Because Kevin Black and them had to, was down there waiting on me, and they had to leave to get to the airport, him and Faye Dubonet, right? So they, they take the limo, and they just, and it was my fault. Because I remember I told you I had that do not disturb on my phone. So... The hotel people didn't give me a wake up call and I was faded and smoked weed, all kind of shit the night before. And then I popped up and then soon and now I'm running through the motherfucking airport nigga, because remember you gotta take them little shuttles. You gotta take them little shuttle like carts in Atlanta to your gate. Right. 
that little transit car you have to take. And nigga, I'm running through the air like airport like OJ Simpson, motherfucker, and the whole Hertz rental car, jumping over shit, nigga, flying, right? <laughs> I'm serious, nigga. I was calling ass because I knew if I didn't get on that flight, I wasn't getting out. They was like too bad because all the flights you wasn't getting out, right? Mm. As I'm getting there, I see the motherfucking teaching agent leaving. You know how they pushing that little stand at that little agent lady or the guy be standing there checking you onto the plane. They was pushing that out the way, so I raced past that. And then as I'm coming down the ramp, I'm seeing the door close to the airplane, and my skinny motherfucking ass must have slid in there on the side like Michael Jackson. <laughs> Pop! And then I said, I made it. And those niggas just sit there, first class, Kevin Black, um, and Faye, and the whole uh, first class started busting up laughing at my ass. Because don't you left me, yeah. So we on the plane, and I tell Faye and I tell Kevin Black this, right? I said I'm not gonna leave now, death row, but I'm gonna leave. And mm-hmm. you know the word was out. We're about to sign Tupac. I said, but well, this is what I'm not gonna do. I'm not coming up there no more. So I told Kevin Black, I told Faye Dubonet, don't you say shit to Jimmy. And don't you say shit to nobody. I say, but one day, she'll just going to ask, what, what Doug Young at? And I said, that day ain't going to be probably till like about maybe a year, year, something. I don't know. See what I'm saying? I told him this. Because remember that Freak Nick is in 94, right? Right. So, so I know Kevin still hadn't said nothing. So I officially quit when I knew Tupac was about to get out of jail, right? I officially quit and just went and told Steve Berman at um, Interscope. Two and a half month old, still making money, still getting paid, still using everything, <laughs> right? Still using all their amenities and shit. Yep, I sure did, motherfuckers. Um, <laughs> so that whole time, sure as fuck did, get the hotel, flight, <laughs> paid, um, but, you know, some things I went through, because I went to murder was the case. You see what I'm saying? I said to myself, hmm. Uh, but I was really gone. I said, you better go show up to that murder was the case video on uh, small film they had, right? Um, so I'm just told, nigga, just go show up to that. But I hadn't been there in a while. But I, they were shooting that across the street from Capitol Records at that little theater on Vine Street, right? So I go over there right. and see my boy sit. Silk is in it. You know, he's playing a role in it. My homegirl, Mia, she in it. You know, me and Silk down there chopping it up. I'm with Tonya. She's in a, a, a D'Angelo video, Brown Sugar, with the with the gold dreadlock that I brought from Denmark. Brought her over from Denmark. She's dancing with Fatima Robinson in that, that Brown Sugar video. Um, right. So me and her, you know, we're in the craft services. You know, we chilling. Everybody's seeing me. Hey, Doug, I ain't seen you in a while. Yeah, man, you know, just, you know, just out in these streets working. I ain't doing shit, nigga. I'm at the house chilling. Working everybody else's pocket, but wasn't fucking around with them niggas, you know, making a whole bunch of money. I think at that time I was working at RBX. RBX had just had a record on, he got on, when he disses Death Row. I was working that record. And me and RBX mm-hmm. was kind of talking a lot. Again, we caught back up with each other. He was over at Warner Brothers. I'm the executioner, you know, remember he, he, where he dissing Dre that song that, there? Um, I was working A-Wall. after him. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They they gave me like $30,000 to do a single. And then they gave me another 20000 then 10000 And then they ended up not putting this album out and had to pay him like a half a million dollars. That was the easiest fucking money I ever fucking made in my life, that shit. I don't know what happened then. Cause remember when Warner Brothers dropped their whole thing? But long story short, mm-hmm. Black calls me one day. He said, man, you was right. He said, Suge asked you this morning. You know how Black talk. She was right, though. Suge asked about you this morning. I said, he 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 quit. Uh, he had some family issues that he had to deal with. Um, and he's like, oh, is he okay? He said, yeah, he's going to be okay. He said, well, just tell him if he ever want to come back, he can come on back. I was just wondering where he was. And um, that's how he found out that I left. 
<laughs> mm. <laughs> hey, you know what? No, I want to shoot this to you. T- I want to shoot this to you too. Now, we all know that you know you, you being behind Welcome to Death Row that changed the guard on how a lot of hip hop films were made. I want to know what were your feelings mm-hmm. about the Death Row Chronicles that came out because that seemed like an updated version of what you guys did. Fuck Death Row Chronicles. I wouldn't do shit with motherfucking PET. Whatever that fucking dude from 30 for 30. Matter of fact, uh, I was going to get, if they was going to do it, I was going to, yeah, to pay me and they going to sit up and tell me. They think they only have a $2 million budget. I'm like, well, what that budget got to do with me? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, well, you know, we can only pay you. Uh, uh, uh. And then to show you how insulting it was. So I go over to uh, TV1, which is right here on Wilshire. At the end of Crenshaw, when Crenshaw is over with, when you're going towards Hollywood, right? Mm-hmm. And um, I'm up there hollering at them because they kept on the holler, kept on the holler at me, kept on the holler at me. So I had already had my mind made up. I'm not fucking with no BET because it ain't black owned no more, and you you trying to get niggas chicken chains. So I'm already up there with I'm answering that and the nigga with an attitude. I got an attitude. You know what I'm saying? Um, so he's talking. And um, he's telling me how much money he don't have. And I kept saying, man, you need to stop saying that. And then this is what made me say, I'm not doing this shit. It was only one black person working behind the scenes up there. Everybody else was white Mm. or Asian. And I ain't mad at none of the Asians and the Latinos that was there. But the showrunner dude, I don't get what his name is, but I think he's Latino. But he wasn't from no hip hop. He's from for twenty for twenty, that ESPN shit. And then I think he was something like nine years old when all that shit was happening. Right. So we just got off on a super bad foot. You know what I'm saying? And I'm cursing right. the motherfuckers out. And I was thinking about coming back up to my little homeboys, uh, but I know these Pices and these eighteenth streets over off West Boulevard on the other side, right? I send them niggas up there, take them niggas quick. Well, I didn't do that shit. I still thought about it. I ain't going to even lie to you because them niggas are like, we should go up there and just take their shit, man. They, huh? But, uh, no, fuck them. I and mean, I was down with, um, I was down with, um, I was down with Dad when he started dissing it because the niggas were just being disrespectful, man. You know what I'm saying? They was disrespectful. Here they want all your intellectual mind right. They want to rape your brain of all your knowledge, and they don't want to give you no money. And then when this nigga got asking me, um, telling me about they only got a two million dollar budget and no black people working behind the scenes, I say, so what? That mean y'all gonna y'all gonna let the people just put their commercials on there for free too, right? Oh, I didn't think so. You know what I'm saying? But some of this shit just be insulting. That's why, like now, that's why I love that person. It's just time for us to do our own shit. We got to stop complaining about shit we don't own. We don't own the shit no more. So, right. make your own shit. And it's as simple as that. And I get it. But, you know, I just did a, 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 a I did, you know, because I took a long time off from doing a major documentary. But I just did something with the BBC, though. That's going to be a feature film. Mm. It's coming out next year. Uh, I should have called, yeah, I did that one because I've always liked the BBC when I'm overseas, especially when I'm in London. Yeah, London's. British Broadcasting mm-hmm. Company. They're, shout out to BBC because they be keeping it thorough out there. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's why I did it, you know. I'm out there. I used to stay off of Oxford somewhere, off of Oxford Street. I like London, you know what I'm saying? Kind of reminds me of San Francisco. Like, always cloudy and foggy looking. But it's kind of nice out there, especially the black area. I love over there. Like uh, Brixton and all those places. Yeah, Brixton, yep. Yeah. And all of that, you know, but the Dean Walls, the club used to be the Dean Walls back in the day out there. That put the shit. And um, so I did do that with the BBC. But other than that, you know, I, I do smaller shows. Motherfucker got some money, got to pay me. I'm not telling you shit. Hey, but speaking of that, we're going to have to put, kick this interview almost into gear because you know, this is one of the hottest days in L.A., bro, and I'm in the coolest part of my house because I, I hate air conditioning. I hate that shit. So it would be too cold. Yes, sir, man. 
Yes, sir, yeah. man. We was, this was a dope, another dope episode, man. You definitely we will have you know part three in the in the in the, in the, in the near future as well, man. Well, you well, always welcome. You guys, like I told y'all, I pull up. I, I always tell y'all, I pull up to y'all show. Y'all, I fuck with y'all. You know, I Doug, fuck with y'all. Doug, we cannot express how grateful and how I mean. I mean, you always got some stuff for us that we will always be thinking when we're not laughing ourselves to death behind it. And just reminiscing on those good times, man, I mean, you know, you're a jewel for the culture, man. You know, we, we got to protect you at all costs. I mean, you oh, mean yeah, so man. much. It's just, man, I mean, it's hip-hop is something I always tell people, man, I fell in love with hip-hop. I'm sorry. I got divorced because of it, cheated. I'm a wife with it. Everything. Hip hop was just man. I can't. I can't explain. I can't, sure. I wasn't shit man. I can't, I can't even lie, man. Hip hop. See, people don't understand. That's just why, even like to this day, think about it. On all these social media platforms, we still argue about old battles from the eighties and nineties. Isn't that crazy? And who's yeah. the best? And what is? Isn't that crazy? But that shows you the power of hip hop. We just had a birthday. Remember, we just, you know. Not too long ago, a couple of days back, you know, 1973 changed a lot of our lives, made a lot of us rich. The boogie Down Bronx, we got to give DJ P. Jones, who met Cool Herc, see that hall on Sedwick, you know what I'm saying, in the Boogie Down yep, Bronx. The museum is about to come. Yep, yeah, the museum is about to come. Got to thank my partner in crime. The, 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 the chief of the university, as you know, I'm in the Universal Hip Hop Museum. You know, Rocky Buchanan, got to thank Curtis Blow, you know what I'm saying? All the people down, Cool Herc, of course, that's all the giants, man. And then everybody give Pete Jones his shout because he, he the one took the chance and gave Cool Herc the chance to use that hall room. You know what I'm saying? And from that point yeah. on, motherfuckers, hip hop has made billionaires now. Yeah, shout out to Jay. It, 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 it truly is a culture, bro. That's why I, I used to be fighting and arguing with them R&B niggas when they used to call it crud music. And I'll never forget the time um, when them niggas started changing their mind when I was um, I was at a studio. I'm going I'm to I'm end this interview on this. I'm paid in full. Right. Still my favorite album of all time, right? Um, mm-hmm. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm L.D. Barnes. Is doing we we in Yamaha Sounds right? Yamaha Sounds is was in his studio in Burbank, and they 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 doing the song "You Wear It Well." Barney Perkins is one of the top engineers in the game, right? Uh, R&B engineers. So we got L in there. We got Louis Johnson on bass. We got Babyface helping L do some stuff. We got Diane Warren is in there. Benny Medina is here just checking and seeing how the project is going. Um, yeah, all kind of motherfuckers in that bitch, right? George Clinton, everybody's in there, right? L had a whole bunch of badass musicians. Um, the, the Nathan East and all them brothers, the, just the top of the top musicians, right? I'm in the motherfucking break room listening to guess what? The Paid in Full album. They come out, everybody come out on a break. And Barney Perkins, he's a big old, big old dude, right? Big old wide dude, right? He, he, he had one of the best R and engineers and R and B engineers ever, Barney Perkins. Just remember the name, you can Google him. Um He said, You still listening to that crud music? I said, you know, crud music, rap ain't going nowhere. He said, That stuff ain't gonna last probably probably a couple of more years. And then um he said, What you listening to? You know, so 'cause they everybody ordered they ordered like ten pizzas or something, right? So everybody coming in when the pizza people got there, Barney said, Let me hear, let me hear. Nigga, now everybody's in there. They about to take an hour break. And I said, you are gonna have to listen to the whole thing if you are gonna listen to it. I'm not letting you hear. I'm putting my fucking earphones back on. Don't right. hear your fucking mouth that they talking shit about rap. Nigga, I let that motherfucking pay full. I let that motherfucking pay full album play the whole motherfucking album all the way through. And everybody just constantly looking at me and they looking at each other and they looking at me and they looking at each other. And even Diane Warren, she's like, I, I like that. And then Barney Perkins said like this, the nigga talking all this shit to me. He said, Doug, 
Uh, you might be right about what you said. He said, whoever that is, they know about jazz, the way that those notes are being done. He said, and, and then he even started breaking shit down. He said, because, man, I, I ain't never not heard a rapper screaming and yelling. He said, I can hear everything he said. And he said, whoever produced this understand the ghost note. And I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about, the ghost note. You know what I'm saying? Right. So then I right. kind of researched a lot of that stuff, right? And the way that Molly Maul chopped that together, and then you also had Paul C. that was on it. This is a white boy, right? Shout out to Paul Who, C., one of the greatest yeah, producers, yeah. DJs. Producers that oh Dan God. don't get his credit. Right, he mixed that album. So you got Molly Maul on it. You got Paul C. on that, right? Yeah. And that right there is where the sonics of that record comes in because Paul C. was a rock musician. You know what I'm saying? So, and then yeah. you, can, you can see where the actual production, the bottom, the structure, the actual stacking, and that the way that those things are like a, 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 a felonious monk. Or a, he said, it, this is what Barney said. It seemed like it made, it was felonious monk, me, me, um, um, what's his name? Um, ah, uh, damn, the bad Dizzy, motherfucker. Dizzy Gillespie. No, no, Cicely Tyson, son. Uh, oh, Cicely. Miles Davis. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Me and Miles Davis. I know Miles. Damn, I'm sorry, Miles. My roommate. I was roommates with Mickey. Miles used to come by our house. My my roommate was his stylist, uh, Mickey. Mm. Um, yeah, I, I knew Miles. Um, that motherfucker was crazy, as motherfucker. That boo, that man. Whoo, that jet dude there. Super Gene, that's a bad motherfucker. Every other word is cuss word come out of his mouth, though. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> every other word come out of his mouth was a cuss word. Um, um, and and then they was like, damn. And then L, as me and L going back to his house, because we was in his car. I left my car at his house, right? Mm-hmm. He said, Doug, he said, he said Doug, put, put that tape in that you was playing. Or what's the name of this group again? I said, it's Eric B. and Rakim. He said, okay. And then um, we get to his house. He said, Doug, I'll buy that tape from you. I said, Dale, you can have it. I, I got tons of them. I'll put tape in my car. I, you know, I was a promoter. You know what I'm saying? I'm promoting at this point. And he was like, um, and then I come back to his house maybe a week later, right? He was like, Doug, you right, man. That 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 record right there is something else. So yeah, you're gonna see me. Hip hop ain't going nowhere. But on that note, guys, peace. See y'all later. Thank you again, Doug, as always, man. Thanks, Look, brother. Be safe out there. Yeah. For sure. All be right, guys. Easy, man. We're gonna stay in touch, time. brother. Okay. All right, man. Peace. Be safe. Thanks again. Peace. Yeah, no problem. Thank you guys. Peace. Yo.